Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this afternoon. Welcome to the workshop on Attack attacking, defending, and monitoring Kubernetes ecosystem. So let me begin by uh, introducing myself. My name is Vasan Chinipili. I am a security enthusiast, uh, currently working as a security architect and a DevSecOps practitioner. My technical abilities and passion span a wide range of technologies ac across various domains of information security, including cloud, container security, penetration testing, uh, DevSecOps, and security automation. I'm also like the developer of the tool named Cube Striker. It's an open source platform agnostic security auditing tool specifically designed to secure the cloud native and tackle Kubernetes cluster security issues. And before we get into like the fascinating world of Kubernetes, I want to tell you what's in store for today. So we will start by setting up by setting up the playground. And then we will have a quick or brief overview of the Docker and the Kubernetes ecosystem and its various components. Then we will look at how they can be attacked using multiple scenarios. Following this, we will also learn some uh, defense mechanisms for various critical resources. And then we'll be looking at some uh, monitoring and alerting techniques that will help us secure cloud native architecture. Well, and also today you will have the opportunity to apply, test and learn these techniques yourself. And also I will showcase some open source tools along with Cube Striker that I have been developing for the last few months. Usually these uh, workshops are designed to go for longer than four hours, but I have slightly modified to fit our schedule today. In the event there is uh, insufficient time to go through all the scenarios or if some scenario doesn't work as expected, I just wanted to let you know beforehand that you will have access to the playground and you can also download this digital guide so you can test these scenarios in your own time and you can reach out to me uh, with any questions through LinkedIn or, or my email address. And uh, needless to say, I want this workshop to be as interactive as possible. So please get involved, share your experiences and insights and please ask and answer questions and just have fun. So let us start with the setting up of the playground. So I'll quickly import I have downloaded the same one. Just follow these instructions, guys. And this is how we actually set up the playground. Make sure you give at least some 6 GB of RAM. You can either use a virtual box or VMware workstation. Anything should be fine. In case if you feel that I'm going at very high pace, let me know so that I will slow down. And if you have any questions, make sure you raise them or instead of messaging them, just uh, speak out so that I don't need to check the Slack channel frequently. Uh, so what's in uh, CPU? Uh, uh, will one CPU is fine or? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, that's fine. Big you. Okay. If you give two, that will be great, but even one is fine. Uh, so, so Vasan, to SSH, I have uh, done some port forwarding. Uh, I hope that is okay. Uh, in fact, you don't need to do for port forwarding as well. But if you look at the setup now, which I'm doing, so let me quickly go through the system. Yep, I have 6 GB of RAM. So this is the important part. Go to the networks. And the first one, make sure it choose always host only. The first one has to be host only. Otherwise, the workshop will not work. Then allow all. And then under adapter to, make sure you choose NAT. This is the only setting that you got to do. So the first one, host only, and choose whatever name that you have created, or there should be one in your box. Otherwise, you can simply create from here, host network manager and create one. And adapter two should be like NAT. This is it. You can either give processes one or two, it shouldn't be mine. So it's all set. Now I'm going to start my VM.
can you all still see my screen yeah okay cool so if you look at the vm is up so the username is basant password is ubuntu tool and now sudo switch user password is ubuntu and here give the command called dh client cool and then just see if you can access it well, could you expand that a little bit please it's too small uh this is the reason why we need to have the ssh, SSH yeah, yeah exactly so but before Perfect. you do it, it it will be like only just for a few just uh, another one to two minutes after that we will have like the big screen Perfect. after the ssh so here sure. ping i can see three google.com there we go we can access the internet Now I will get the IP address of this machine to SSH. So my IP address is 192.168.99.122. SSH person at the IP address. Is the screen visible now? Or do you want a bigger font? Bigger font would be nice. Is this good? Yeah. Okay, cool. I have logged in. So is everyone till this point? I'll just wait for another few minutes. If you have, if you have any issues, let me know. So this is where I need to start with. Wasn't how to download the document? Document? can be accessed from this website. I have put it in the Zoom chat, the link for this. It's 5485-152-25 for 3000. Oh, is there a way we can download it? Oh yes, you can absolutely download the document. Towards the right side of the page, there is something called print this book. So if you click on print, you should be able to download the PDF. So I want you all to speak up. Did everybody reach till this point? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. So can we go ahead with the rest of the setup? Yes. yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Perfect. I want you to be speaking. So we will go into this documentation. We will just copy and paste the commands as is. Right, so we are to this point. Cool. So let us get into this folder. And let us run this command dot slash requirements. Let's make sure everything is up and running. And do you guys see the similar screen? Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep, perfect. And then let's run this command. Let's make sure you copy and paste this command as is. It's create 
iPhone N workshop, iPhone W2. And this setup is like the main setup, guys. If you want to go ahead with the rest of the workshop, ensure it is all working up and fine. And this setup may take anywhere close to five to 10 minutes, depending on your internet connection. Don't worry even if it takes time. I just had a question on the background, like what's actually happening? Is this a script running and what does it do? Yeah, you will have an idea once this is all running. Uh, Osant, I had an error with installing Go, I mean, the requirements, like it says Go not found. I mean, it's started installing Go. All right, so just give the command called delete iPhone N workshop and just rerun the command again. Just let's ensure we have the internet. Yep, we have internet. Create like an workshop at W2. Once if this setup is done, the rest of the workshop will be like pretty quick. Uh, got an error saying uh, error to start code base server. Should I be doing something? Yep. Then issue the command delete space iPhone N space workshop and then give the command again create iPhone N workshop iPhone W2. Uh, delete uh, space N. Uh, space, can, can, you, can you look at my screen? Can you see my screen? So I have highlighted the command. Oh, got it. Delete iPhone okay. and workshop. And then again, the same command create iPhone and workshop iPhone W2. This will uh, actually download a bunch of uh, container images, which may uh, come up to like three to four gigs. That's the reason why it may take some time, depending on your internet connection. Sure. Usually mine takes a bit of time because internet is pathetic in Australia. Right. Did anyone else come up with the everything script saying like the whole setup has been done? Yep. Done was uh, happy hacking. Okay, perfect. Now you need to browse to the page. On the second thing where it says installing build server, you will also get an IP address saying that please access your build server on the IP port number 8787 8080. So just access, yeah, you will you guys need to access this build and deploy server. Is everyone up to this point? No, mine's is still I... not yet. No, no problem. Uh... Great. Yeah, this, this phase will take a bit of time, five to 10 minutes. After that, everything is done. So I'm continuing I'm to face the same issue. Uh... Sorry, who is that? Who is facing the issue? Uh, this is Uday. I'm, I'm facing yeah. the issue where it says uh, error to start code base server. Uh, I tried a couple of times by deleting and. Uh, okay, no problem with that. Could you please try this command ping c 3 and google.com and see you have internet connection? You're able to ping the site? Yeah, I had tried it earlier. Let me. Yeah, I'm able to ping in the internet. So uh, try it just one more time delete iPhone and workshop and then create iPhone and workshop iPhone W2. Uh, hey, uh, Vashan, just have one question. I don't question. understand why it is picking the 10 dot series IP addresses for me. Uh, yeah, that's because you missed dot... one thing which I have told you earlier. Uh, you may have to restart your VM again. So under settings, 
you'll have to make sure your network, the first one is host only adapter. Could you please check this setting? The first one has to be host only adapter. And the second one needs to be NAT. Probably you should have put it the other way. The first one NAT and the second one host only. Uh, it's, it's clearly given in the documentation, like how you should be doing. So even if you follow the steps given in this documentation, you guys should be able to get it up and running. And we won't be doing anything out of this documentation. Even if you miss something, everything is available here. Hey, Avasan, just have one question. Mm -hmm. So that uh, website, right, for the documentation, mm -hmm. uh, will that be available only for the period of workshop? Uh, yes, this will be available during the workshop. But what you can do is, towards the right side of the website, there is a print this book option. You can click on print and save the PDF. Okay, got it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, guys, everyone till here, rest of the members, whoever doesn't have issues. Uh, Vasan, I have this issue. So I configured the uh, networking the other way. Uh, mm -hmm. First uh, with NAT and second is uh, uh, with uh, host only. I'm just no, no, no. That and Sorry, the first I'm one is host that. only. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for the rest of the everyone, whoever has the setup is up and running, I want you all to get into this one. Just access this build and deploy server, go to this IP address. And the username is admin, password is Vasan. Everything is given in the documentation. Then I want you all to click on this infra and while this setup is happening, we will cover some uh, theory part. So usually it takes a bit of time at this stage where it says uh, creating another Jenkins build server. Usually you should be able to see the screen. So before uh, <clears throat> we get into the main stuff, I have like a few theory part and few basics to cover. I'm sure like most of the, most of you would be like pretty much aware about like what containers are, what Kubernetes is, is, what microservices are. However, I still would like to give like a quick touch up to ensure everyone is on the same page. So well, uh, to begin with, microservices architecture splits your application into multiple services that perform fine grained functions and are still part of your application as a whole. It's because uh, the advantages associated with microservices, such as like their allowance of agile development and artifacts and an architecture that is like highly maintainable and testable, which enables business to develop and roll out new digital offerings faster. It is like become an obvious choice for most of the organizations. So we have like these microservices running, but where do you put these microservices? in containers. So basically these containers are like packages of your software that include everything that it needs to run, including the code, dependencies, libraries, binaries, and more. This gives like the developers the ability to create predictable environments that can be run anywhere and also allows container-based applications to be deployed easily and consistently regardless of whether the target environment is a private data center, the public cloud, or even a developer's personal laptop. And this containerization is the trend that is taking over the world to allow people to run all kinds of different applications in a variety of different environments. So when they do that, they need an orchestration solution in order to keep track of all these containers and schedule them and orchestrate them. That's where the Kubernetes comes into action. Well, the Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform that automates many of the manual processes involved in deploying, managing, and scaling containerized applications. You can think of Kubernetes as you would a conductor for an orchestra. In the same way, a conductor would say how many trumpets are needed, which one plays the first trumpet, and how loud each should play, etc. A container orchestrator would say how many web servers, front-end containers are needed or back-end containers are needed, what they serve, and how many resources are to be dedicated to each one. And one thing uh, I want you all to note is Kubernetes does not include the functionality for creating or managing container images and it does not by itself run containers. It needs to work with an external container source and runtime. 
like uh, it's, it's because it needs a container runtime in order to orchestrate. Kubernetes mostly and commonly used with Docker, but it can also be used with any other container runtime like RunC, CRIO, or ContainerD, or some other container runtimes that you can deploy with Kubernetes. Well, needless to say, Kubernetes is like very hot in DevOps space and is now the third most wanted platform among developers. Well, getting started with Kubernetes is easy. It takes a matter of minutes to set up a new cluster and run applications. However, the real concerns or a challenge is what follows is the pivotal question of how to make sure your cluster is secure. For any organization, security should be like the primary concern and not an afterthought because as we all know too well, especially in the current COVID environment, prevention is always better than cure. In fact, like, let me tell you exactly what happens in the real world when the Kubernetes clusters aren't secured properly. On July 19, 2019, the second largest auto finance company like in the United States who operates a responsible disclosure program where security researchers can disclose potential vulnerabilities received an email. That email was not a vulnerability disclosure email, but an email notifying them that they have been hacked and also with the link to leaked information that contain huge amounts of credit card data, social security numbers and bank account numbers. The company was asked to pay like 80 million civil penalty for its role in the security breach that exposed the personal data of more than 100 million customers. And here is the another one with the value of uh, Cryptocurrencies are skyrocketing and limitless compute resources located in the cloud. Hijacking resources has become a lot more lucrative than just a stealing info. World's famous automaker was one of the earlier victims of crypto jacking when a Kubernetes cluster was compromised due to an administrative console not being password protected. And it's called Tesla. And what was interesting about this attack was the number of ingenuine precautionary measures taken to avoid detection. The attackers also made sure that the mining script didn't use enough CPU resources to cause an alarm or get detected. These are like just two examples. There are like many other examples like a Microsoft Kubeflow or Docker, content, Docker Hub where the attackers managed to implant malicious Docker images last year. I know that we have understood the dangers facing our industry and given the knowledge gap among teams and lack of solid security measures to protect Kubernetes, you might be wondering how in the world are we going to secure all these moving pieces and stop these attacks? Well, you're in the right place because that's exactly what we are going to learn today. We are going to look at some important uh, tips and some lessons to secure like major critical or moving pieces inside the Kubernetes cluster. How many of you like have already had experience working with Kubernetes? You can just uh, give a small reaction. Yeah, I don't think it's possible here, but just at, let me at least type S yes or no so that it will give me an idea. Like how many of you are like familiar with Kubernetes or working with Kubernetes day in and day out. So I will continue with the workshop in the same pace to ensure everyone is on the same pace. Cool. Now, if you go back to this Jenkins page or to the build server, at the bottom, you should see the command called proceed or abort. Just don't click on anything, just leave it as is. So could you please all confirm that you're all till this step? Uh, not yet, uh, Vasant. For me, it's still installing build server is what it is. Yeah, that's fine, but still it is running. At least you could log in yeah, and yeah. see everything is working, right? Perfect. That's all good. So before we begin the workshop, let's uh, quickly cover the main components of Kubernetes. The Kubernetes like uh, follows a client server architecture model and the working Kubernetes deployment is called a cluster. Basically you can visualize a cluster as two parts, the control plane and the compute machines are the worker nodes. So what happens in the Kubernetes control plane? If the control plane is the brain of the operations, the worker nodes are the muzzles. So let's start with the nerve center of the Kubernetes cluster, the control plane. So the control plane is in like constant contact with your nodes. If you have configured your cluster to run a certain way, the control plane makes sure it does. And the Kube API server, if you need to interact with your Kubernetes cluster, talk to the API. The API is the front end of the Kubernetes control plane. The next one is Kube scheduler. Is your cluster healthy? If new containers are needed, where will they fit? These are the concerns of the Kubernetes scheduler. The next one is controller manager. Controller manager takes care of actually running the cluster and the Kubernetes controller manager contains uh, several controller functions in one. So HCD, 
Another important piece like configuration data and information about the state of the cluster lives in HCD. It's a key value store database. It's fault tolerant and distributed. HCD is designed to be like the ultimate source of truth about your cluster. So what happens in the Kubernetes node? The worker nodes are the muzzles. They are the ones who actually run and control all the pods and containers from your cluster. You can have zero or more worker nodes on your cluster, although it is not recommended to run your pods on the same node as the control plane. So what is a pod? A pod is the smallest and the simplest unit in the Kubernetes object model. It represents a single instance of an application. The next one is kubelet. Each compute node contains a kubelet. It's a tiny application that communicates with the control plane. The kubelet makes sure the containers are running in a pod. When the control plane needs something to happen in a node, the kubelet executes the action. So this is what a DevOps guy or a normal engineer or any normal system admin will look at. But let's see how the attacker looks at the Kubernetes architecture. So if you look at the previous diagram, it says the communications go through like the Kubernetes API server. This is like what defines and controls all of the Kubernetes management and operational functions. The Kubernetes API service acts as the front door to any cluster. It is generally exposed on every deployment since it's needed for management purposes. But exposing your Kubernetes API server to the public is the most common entry point for attackers. It's actually really a juicy target. Malicious actors will always try to get access to the Kube API server in the control plane. And once these are compromised, they can then proceed to compromising the whole cluster. At times, it may not be a bad day for just your cluster, but also for your cloud account or the underlying infrastructure where the cluster is running. And the next one is etcd. It's a key value store and a core component of the Kubernetes cluster. And it's a main data storage location for your cluster. This means that all of your cluster objects are saved here. Anyone who gains access to the etcd targets to retrieve service account tokens and secrets. It's like once if an attacker has access to a privileged secret or a token, then it's game over. A very quick win for the attacker. And apart from these, there are like a host of ports to worry about. It's not just uh, the HCD service and the Kubernetes API that you need to be cautious uh, about leaving exposed. For example, like the kubelet exposes endpoints which grant powerful control over the node and the containers when compromised. Anyone by gaining control of a kubelet, the attacker has gained unfettered access to the Kubernetes application. This is an end game too. And needless to say, the last one is like the container runtime. A component enables the functionality required to start, run, and manage containers on a given node, for example, Docker. I can't stress enough how important it is to secure your workloads or containers. A privileged container, when gained access, gives an attacker the privilege to run a command in the context of that container or even the option to escape and access the underlying host resources. This is an end game too. An attacker who gains access to the container has gained access to your cluster and eventually the underlying cloud account. And the last one is like the threat matrix. The MITRE attack framework covers like various stages that are involved in cyber attacks and elaborate like known methods in each of them. These matrices help organizations understand the attack surface in their environments and also make sure they have adequate uh, detections and mitigations to various risks. Today, we will be looking most of these scenarios it would be like initial gaining access or execution, persistence, privilege escalation, defense evasion, uh, credential access, discovery, literal movement, collection. We would be looking at all these components in the attack and defense scenarios. I'm sure like uh, you said, most of you are like already aware with Kubernetes, but we will still look at at very high level a few Kubernetes commands, which we'll be using for the rest of the workshop. So I want you all to practice these commands. Even without practicing, you can still go ahead. We can go ahead with the rest of the scenarios, but I will quickly show you all these very high level commands. So is everyone following me? Do you think I should slow up my pace or speed up? Any comments or any messages is appreciated. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, no uh, since I think that the build um, build is getting failed, uh, then can show. Right. So um, in the message in the Zoom chat, can you all just uh, ping me like yes or no? Whoever has like the build succeeded. I mean, everybody should be yeah. reaching out this stage. So yeah, so after the login, I got that. I got that screen. I also clicked on proceed. So is that fine? 
Now you don't need to click on it, just leave it for it as of now. If you click on proceed, like basically it will consume lots of other resources. I'll tell you when to click on proceed. So, but still, if you are till at this stage, it's all good. Um, so what are commands you have run, right? How do you check that actually create minus n workshop? I didn't save it as a file. How do you go and check it? Uh, that output is very important. So you can just go back to your screen and or else you can take a screenshot of this screen or I can tell you one thing. It's very simple. Just go to the documentation. And if we get into, if you go to this page, just make a note of these IP addresses, just replace this IP with your IP and everything else is same. Okay. It's as simple. The first one at this stage, we are accessing like your IP and port 8080. You should be able to see like the Jenkins build, which is happening. So, so what, what is the password for the build server? Sorry. Uh, so I highly advise you all to follow the documentation. So in the documentation, we have everything given. See, if you look at here, it says the username Edwin and the password of Asant. Okay. So if you have any doubt, just refer to the documentation first. And if you still have any doubt, just uh, raise your concern or just message me here. So we will quickly start with very basic commands of uh, Kubernetes. You may simply just click on it and then run the command. I will also make another thing. And these things, you don't need to wait for me to do it. You can just do it by yourself. You have all the commands in the documentation. Just see if everything is working as expected. So if you want to see like the cluster info, this is a command. And for example, getting any resources, we use the command called kubectl get, and then you can define if it is a namespace or a pod or a node or a deployment. So it's kubectl get pods, kubectl get nodes, or if you want to get all, everything in all namespaces, you need to define iPhone A and kubectl get pods iPhone A. So when you give this command, kubectl get pods iPhone A, you should see every uh, pod is up and running. If you still have Jenkins or something still uh, coming up, that's absolutely fine. And if you want to get uh, output of something, kubectl get pod, for example, if you want to grab the information of this Jenkins build, give that one. Okay, no. YAML. So this particular pod is running in the namespace called Jenkins. So we provide iPhone N Jenkins. This is how you can see like the configuration of any particular deployment or any pod. And for example, in order to get the namespaces, you give the command call kubectl get namespace to see all the namespaces. If you want to see namespaces in any of the particular namespace, we define it like this, kubectl get pods, you provide iPhone n flag and the namespace where you want to see the pods. And if you want to, for example, create any namespace, you can simply kubectl create namespace and for example, anything called KCD, it says namespace created. And again, if you want to see those namespaces, kubectl get NS, you have like the namespace created. Then for example, if you want to create any of the deployment, kubectl iPhone N, the namespace which we have created, KCD, And then it says the deployment has been created. You can see that by kubectl get deploy FNA.
You can also create uh, resources by creating like the YAML manifestation files like this. For example, this will create a role called dev user and this will create called a role binding, which we'll be discussing in the next steps. But in case if you want to apply or create some resources using the manifestation files, you'll be saving these uh, thing in a YAML file, some file.yaml, and you can simply apply it as kubectl apply ifnf and the name of the file. And if you want to see what are the rights or the privileges that you have inside your cluster, kubectl auth can I is the command which you will be using. So kubectl auth, can I create pods? Yes. Can I create secrets? Yes. Can I list secrets? Yes. This is how you can see what all privileges that you have got inside the cluster. And iPhone iPhone as is another important uh, thing which we'll be using in for some situations or scenarios in the workshop. We use basically iPhone iPhone as whenever we want to uh, impersonate a particular user. So here I'm saying kubectl auth can I create pod as user Dave? It says no because there is no user Dave. We haven't created a user. We haven't given any privileges. But that is how we use iPhone iPhone as in order to impersonate a user. And this is the command we use to get the secrets, kubectl get secret. So if you want to describe a secret, we use the command called describe. You can try it. And for example, in case of any issue, if you want to see, describe it like what is the issue going on. For example, kubectl get Boy, if an A, and then I want to describe kubectl describe this one. My fn cd. That way we can see like what's happening with this deployment. And if you want to see the logs of any particular pod, first thing is kubectl get pods if an a and then kubectl logs let us see the logs of the control plane hmm. we need to provide the namespace cube system so this is how you see the logs of any of the pods and if you want to see like the events that are happening inside the kubernetes kubernetes get events these are like very important commands which we may be using in the workshop going forward during the monitoring sessions or to see what's happening inside the cluster, what an attacker is doing, being a system admin, how to uh, identify malicious events that are happening inside the cluster. That is the reason why we are looking at very uh, high commands. And for example, if you want to exec into any of the containers, this is the command we use, kubectl exec. So, kubectl get pods, kubectl exec iphone id, let us choose this pod, iphone n, kcd, iphone iphone slash bin slash bash. So there we go, we are inside the container. That's how we get our exec inside the container. These are some other commands that I will leave for you all guys to try. Could be you can try it now, or you can try after the workshop. Like I said, you will have the playground and you will have this digital guide. For example, if you want to list a particular pods, this is how you grab kubectl get pods, and then we grab. And deleting something will be like this. For example, if we want to delete this deployment called Nginx, we give kubectl delete
Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. So kubectl get deploy. This is the deployment I should be deleting. There we go, the deployment has been deleted. And also let's delete the namespace that we have created. Delete case a day. So there are like some other important commands which will help you if you want to get all the container images that are running inside the, all the namespaces. This is the command. This will list all the containers. If you want to list containers images by pods. Yep, this is another important piece which we will be exploring during the attacking scenarios like cube config, which plays a very vital role in, in the whole Kubernetes setup that we are doing today. Kubectl config view. So we will be discussing about config in the next few minutes, but this is the command which is used to view your config file. And these are some other important commands that you can try post workshop. Now let's quickly look at what a cube config is. For example, we just tried this command kubectl config view, and this is the output that we got. So here, the resources like cluster contains like the endpoints data for a Kubernetes cluster. This includes the fully qualified URL of the Kubernetes API server. And the user basically defines the client credentials for authenticating the Kubernetes cluster. A user has a name which acts as its key within the list of user entries after cube config is loaded and merged. And the context defines a named cluster or a user or a namespace. And the current context is the nickname or the key for the cluster user namespace that kubectl will use by default. So guys, uh, is everyone till here following me? And they can you can try the rest of the commands at your own pace. No need to rush at this stage. So can we go ahead with the rest of the scenarios? We can. Go ahead and start with like the attacks. A quick yes or no. Yeah. Okay. Yes, cool. yes, yes. So, uh, what am I, Harsha yeah. here? I have this issue. Uh, like when I'm switch, when I have switched from uh, the first uh, networking, uh, first with host and second is NAT, I was not able to connect to internet actually. Uh, right. So what you need to do is first of all log in into the VM. Yeah. And then do this one. I want you to do sudo switch user and give the password you want to. Yeah. And now run dh client. Uh, it says operation. Okay. So did you sudo switch user? Are you running this command as root? Yeah, 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 yeah. DH client, yeah. Yeah, did it work? DH client, uh, didn't say anything at least one moment. No, that's fine. Did the command run properly without any errors? Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, cool. Now, can you type something like ping c 3 googlecom Yeah, okay. Cool. Right, now just run this command, IP address and grep init, and you should see something like starting with 192, something like that. And then you need to SSH Basant at that IP address. Yeah, got it. Got it. Password is Ubuntu. Cool. And then after you log in into the host again, give sudo switch user and the password is Ubuntu and you're all set. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. And I think now you need to create the setup. So go to the next. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I have already created that. I'm just recreating it. Okay. Yeah. We will do that. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, guys, so we, it's been like almost one hour. 
So from here, we have like important things like attacks. This phase will take up to like one hour. You will see some like interesting real-time attacks. And then we will see some defense mechanisms. And then we'll be looking at a good monitoring stack, how to monitor these attacks inside the infrastructure. And we will see like some build phase security like container scanning tools. And then we will also look at the runtime security, a live runtime uh, security scenarios. And then we'll be looking at some tools or trade some important uh, tools that we will be using today. So the scenarios will work like this. I'll give you all some time, like maybe like five to 10 minutes to try. And then I'll walk you all through those scenarios or else you can follow me and then you can try the same stuff on your machines as well. So in the scenarios one, two, three, and four are like linked together. Well, uh, like we discussed before, there are like host of ports to worry about inside the cluster. And the first thing to realize when thinking about uh, securing cloud-based Kubernetes clusters is that there are attackers and bots constantly searching the internet for exposed API servers and host of ports related to Kubernetes. It is very critical that the Kube API server is not left publicly exposed or there is some kind of anonymous access or it could be like insecure port or kubelet read write ports. You know what, uh, although this is not enabled by default now, some engineers like me might end up giving some more permissions to anonymous users for testing purposes or leave some ports open for testing and then forget to reward those changes once the testing is done. So these are some scenarios which we came across during the uh, security assessments or the penetration testings where an anonymous user has been given access or there are some unsecured ports or kubelet read write ports were kept open to the public. So I want you all to identify how do you go ahead and find these ports and after finding those ports, what you can actually grab from those ports. So if you also have like the solutions, I want you all to start with this command, kubectl cluster hyphen info. This will give you like your cluster. And I want you to all to run this command, kubectl get po iphone wide. And I want you all to make a note of this IP address. This is the IP address of your control plane. So we will be using this IP address in the rest of the steps. So what you will be doing is now quickly install a scanner called nmap in order to identify all the open ports that are running on your uh, control plane. This is a very quick one. It shouldn't take more than a few seconds. And let's run this command. Usually to make your lives easier, I have given like commands or the ports which are actually open for the workshop just to save some time. So we have like around uh, six ports that are open on this machine. And just with a little bit of Googling, you should be able to identify like what are the common um, Kubernetes API server secure ports or insecure port or the kubelet read write or read only ports. But for now, I'll be, I'll be giving you the solution. Usually Kubernetes API server runs on port 6443 or port 443, 8443 or any other defined port. And we have like kubelet uh, read write port on port 10250 and read only port 10255. And these are like the etcd clients and etcd servers. And this is like Kubernetes insecure port. Now that we have identified a host of ports running on the Kubernetes control plane, being an attacker, what we do is we try to grab some information. We will see whether we, will, we are able to reach out that particular port or not. 71 is route five. Let us start with secure port 6443 slash grab thank you. There you go, you're able to access that endpoint. And these are other endpoints which are available on that. Yep, on that host, code 171 is There are some interesting things like API, API v1, APIs. You can try and see what's everything lives on these different endpoints. So I will start with a few basic things slash 
version it will give us different versions or if you want to see api so it will give you some other information about the server address and the client cidr or if you want to see api under v1 it will give host of things such as like secrets or resource quotas or service accounts now if you want to access any of these things you would be simply appending that particular endpoint here api slash v1 slash secrets api slash v1 slash pods or api slash v1 slash nodes and guys like i said this is not enabled by default but it doesn't mean that this cannot happen and we usually come across these scenarios in security assessments in most of the companies and this is like you have an control plane listening on a secure port with anonymous access enabled that is the reason why we are able to access this we are able to curl the endpoint and get all the information without providing any authentication token or anything and the reason for this is giving an anonymous user a cluster admin or some kind of access so if you want to find out how it was made possible the solution is like let us issue the command call let us see what are the different uh, role bindings that we have QC delegate role bindings and you should see something called anonymous review access So if you look at this particular a uh, role binding which will which we'll be discussing further about what is a role what a role binding is but for now at this stage there is a user called system anonymous needless to say in plain english anonymous and this particular user has been bounded with a role called admin cluster admin role has been bounded to this user called anonymous that's the reason why any anonymous user without any authentication can access all the resources and perform any operation inside the cluster this is a major bug and it still happens in most of the environments. We'll also be looking at how to avoid these things in the next coming different scenarios. Anyhow, needless to say, no, because you know how this happened, it's simply deleting or defending, not giving anonymous users any kind of privileges will stop this attack. Wasn't quick question over here. This yes. is not by default. Uh, th this role binding it doesn't exist by default, right? It has been created by somebody. And exactly, somebody. absolutely, that's right. So most of the times, in order to bypass the VPN connections or any other kind of uh, authentication mechanisms in place, usually like the DevOps or system admins to make sure their life easier, they do these kind of things, and at times they forget to revert these changes. So being a security architect or like a security professional, this will be like one of the points in my checklist to ensure like there is no anonymous access enabled to the cluster. But if this is enabled, this is what can happen. Right. Sure. And the next one is the scenario two. Now that we have seen a secure port where we have anonymous access enabled, now we also have like insecure port if you have like an insecure port on your kubernetes cluster open it by default gives a wide access to everyone there is no like anonymous user you don't need to bind any uh, role bindings or roles to anyone if some insecure port is open in your cluster anybody can access it that's it your cluster is gone so the next challenge would be like to identify where that insecure port is and then i want you to all to run these commands so I'll give you a quick hint. So we have run this command and we are done with this port 6443. And probably 2379, 2380 are like the etcd clients. And these are like read, write and read only ports. And this is the other port which is up and running. So I want you to all to hit this port and see what you can grab. I'll give you like quick five minutes. And you also have the commands here. So you also know the IP address of your control pane, which you use till now. It's just that you need, you should be using like the port number and try to hit different endpoints. So you have like two to three minutes to go. Then we will pick up with the next scenario. Hey, Vasan, there's some issue with my cluster. It says it doesn't have any resources of type pods or services or anything. 
and i am at that stage in jenkins where it says to proceed or what should i do something there well, that, that's absolutely fine you don't need to do anything so did you create any alias something like that um no not really okay is it just are uh, you trying to give the same commands kubectl get po yep. okay yep. so could you please ping me a message on chat i'll give you the command Uh, okay, so it is Arnav, right? Uh, Nikhil. Oh, is it Nikhil? Okay. All right, just give me one second. Okay. And also, did you run the commands as is, like create hyphen n workshop hyphen w two, or did you give any different commands before? Ah uh, no, I same thing. Create hyphen n workshop hyphen w two. Okay, so Nikhil. And that finished without any error. Okay, perfect. No problem. So I have sent you one command. Just run it in your uh, terminal. So Should I be doing this in the super user or normal version? Uh, that's fine. Just run it as a super user. No problem. And the upcoming scenarios will be like very interesting. We'll be chaining like different attacks. We'll be looking at some privilege escalations, lateral movements, and bypassing some controls. Right, so everyone up with solution two, can we go ahead with to the scenario number three? Do you all have any questions? Yes, no, any issues with scenario two? Okay. So Nikhil, are you able to run? Yes, or something. Working. Is it working? Oh, all good. Yep. Perfect. See, because it's the same VM I have given to everyone. So if it is working in one machine, it should ideally run in the rest of the machines, unless you do some mistake. Cool. Now let's move on to scenario number three. Again, a quick one. Though this time we'll be exploring like um, in the first two scenarios we have seen kubelet, I um, mean, insecure port and secure port with uh, anonymous access. But now we'll be looking at a uh, kubelet read, write, and read only ports when they're exposed. The scenario number three is where like the kubelet read, write port is exposed. So we will see how an attacker can abuse in case of, if a kubelet read, write port is exposed to the public. Or at times an attacker might already gain access to your internal infrastructure. And then still he can start playing with your open ports if he's already inside the network. You don't need to explicitly expose them to the public, but if somebody gains access to your network, they can still start playing with it. So it's going to be, it's just everything else will remain the same. It's just, uh, you will change the port number. Port number is 10250. Slash, if you want to see some information, some endpoints are like running pods. It will give you the list of all the pods that are running inside the cluster. You want to list all the deployments. Yep, this is a command. And then if you want to see like the list of containers running on those worker nodes. So this is how you identify all the containers. 
Now, there is something called an extra mile. <clears throat> the reason why we say this as read write port it's because if somebody has access to this port they can even in fact start interacting with your cluster and then I can actually have like write privileges which means they can create or they can delete something for example in this scenario let's uh, start with uh, creating some files in one of the containers and see how it works If we try to create a file called something besides .txt. Let's also create one more file called kcv.txt. Right, and now let's see if that command has actually created something. Well, it has actually created files like whatever we have given, kcv.txt. So that's how we can actually create some files or anything. And now let us look at something called a reverse shell where usually the attackers or the penetration testers, which they actually use, it's like they, if, if you're like sitting inside the network, instead you directly coming to one of the open ports where a firewall might attempt to discover your actions. If you perform a connection from inside the network to the outside, there are less chances of finding out a firewall. So this is what we call it as a reverse shell. So we say that, hey, this is an attacker IP or a port number. So initiate a reverse connection from inside the network. So this is what we are going to try now. So for that, you can create, you can open up one more tab on your local host. So now I will try to get the IP address. So this is my local IP address, which will be like the attacker's IP. And I use a tool called netcat. Or if anyone who doesn't have a netcat installed on your machines, what you can do is use one more console and you can simply SSH to the VM box and you can run this command. And what I will do is Hello. Yep. Yeah, I can, I can, sorry, uh, there was a slight bit of disturbance. Well, what is the reverse shell again? Sorry. Uh, right. So usually when, when doing penetration testing or when some attacker trying to do something on your network, they try to connect to the services or the host or to the open ports that are running inside your network. So if I happen to directly connect to your open port or an open service in your environment, there are chances that firewall might not allow that particular thing or there are also chances that some endpoint protection might identify it as an anomaly. In order to avoid these things, instead of directly connecting to the point, what attackers or penetration testers will do is, they will have an open port or running on a particular IP address in their machine. And from inside the network, they initiate a reverse connection saying that, hey, instead of me connecting directly, the machine will now directly initiate a connection to the attacker because now the network or the connection is being initiated from inside the network, the chances of being detected or being identified is very low. So in this scenario, what I'm doing is, this is like the attacker machine. I have a netcat listening on port 7777. So I'm saying that I'm issuing a command on one of the pods
So if you observe carefully, I'm running this command in one of the pods because there is a kubelet redirect pod open. So this command is being run inside the pod and from inside the pod, a connection is being uh, issued from inside the pod to the external attacker. So this is the external attacker listening on port 7777 on, on this IP address. And we are saying, hey, connect to that particular IP on the port. So when you run this command, you should ideally see something here. There you go. You got like the access or the reverse connection from that machine. And if you see uname, it's a Linux. Host name, it is like the workshop dev control plane. So we got a connection from the control plane. So this is called reverse shell. You can ideally like Google this stuff. What is like a reverse shell? There are like many good tutorials. What is a reverse shell and how these reverse shells will actually work because we, we are going to use this in one or two scenarios going forward. So, well, this concludes like the scenario number three. And scenario number four is like the kubelet read only port. So it runs on port 10255 slash pods. And I'm leaving it to you to identify what are the different endpoints that are running. It could be pods or running pods or metrics. You have like two minutes to try this one. Everything else remains the same. It's just the port number will change this time. And from scenario number five, everything is going to be a bit uh, high level and it requires some efforts and thinking. Yes, we have quick two minutes. Uh, hey, Vasant, I, Harsha here. I got stuck at this Jenkins job where it's not able to create a, uh, the cluster itself. Okay, Harsha, no problem. You can go back to your console and give the command called, I will ping you two commands. Just type them. Yeah, sure. Like I ping you in the chat. Yeah, sure. Can you ping in the chat for reference? I'm sorry, which commands, guys? Uh, is everyone else up to this point? Just an S or no? Uh, so, so, Vasant, my build on the Jenkins has failed, but if I look at uh, uh, the backend, except for, I think, uh, yeah, uh, two containers, which says container creating, and the Jenkins shows us uh, in it zero slash one. Uh, the rest of the cluster seems okay. So I can run but, some of these commands. But yeah, hey, absolutely. You can go ahead. And Jenkins is like a huge one. It'll take some time. No problems. Okay. You can continue with the rest of the commands. And like the scenarios five, six, seven, and eight, they are like linked together. We will see how an attacker gains access inside the network by exploiting a vulnerable web application, and then how they create contain vulnerable container images, how they bypass the internal registries, or how they try to get or create and push some vulnerable containers into private registries and then gain access, this kind of stuff. The scenarios five, six, and seven, eight are linked together. So I want you to all to concentrate and pay more interest here. These are like very live scenarios which we came across in one of the assessments. So at the very beginning when you ran uh, the command, it gave you like the list of IP addresses and ports. So we have a web application running on port uh, 68787. Uh, so I want you to all to access this one. So take your IP address and port 6767. So you will see a small, oops, oops, sorry, it's 8787. Here is a web application running, something like health check server. So it basically takes commands, gives something like this, test-ls, 
should see some output coming. So ideally, they, this is called code execution. These kind of issues happen when your web application takes some input from the user and without properly validating, it executes these commands directly on the underlying host or the container. This is called code execution. So during a penetration testing or or an attacker gets to know that there is a remote code execution or command execution bug in one of the applications. And then from here, we see how they try to gain access to the pods and to the underlying infrastructure altogether. If you go back to the documentation, so we got some output here, which is like base64 encoding. I want you to all to see this echo. Basically, it will decode this thing. So when you shoot the command ls, these are the files that exist on this one. Let us issue one more command. This time, let us issue id. And we got some more output. What I'll do is, and see what this output says. So we have given id, and it says these are the things. So now let's continue with the rest of the things. Now that we have identified there is a code execution bug inside this container, what I'm going to do is the attacker will try to perform a reverse connection. So this is the one which the attacker uses. So I want you to all to be very careful with this one. What you're going to do is you put this command here and there are two parameters which you should be changing. So this is the attacker IP, which is like your host IP, wherever you're trying to attack. For example, in my case, this is my attacker IP and I am initiating a netcat listener on port 7777. So I will give this IP address and port 7777 here. So in the place of attacker IP and the port number, 7777. I want you to all to be a bit careful with this step and make sure you give the right port number and the IP and then click on encode. Otherwise, there are chances that it might corrupt uh, this container and we may have to build a few things again. So after you have like the appropriate IP and the port number, click on encode. And you should see, yeah, there we go. We got like the reverse shell from that uh, particular host or like the host where this web application is running. So now the attacker has gained access to the underlying host where the web application is hosted. Now he performs a little enumeration on that machine and let's see what an attacker will do from here. The first command he gives is like ID and see what, okay, he is running as a root and he gives, tries to identify the environment variables and looking at the environment variables, he identifies that this is a Kubernetes pod which is running or the web application is running on the Kubernetes pod. And from here, we quickly do these things. We get into the temp folder. And we try to download the kubectl. And you need to give these three commands. Otherwise, the kubectl is already installed inside that machine. What you will be doing is kubectl cluster and info. There we go. Now the attacker has access to the kubectl cluster and info. And let's see actually what this particular user has privileges to perform here. So as we have seen before, kubectl auth can I will help us to identify the privileges that a particular user has got. So it says he can get, list, create, update, execute, and these things, and so I said. So let us see kubectl auth. Oops. Kubectl auth, can I get PO? Yes, it says you can get the pods. Let us see if you can also get all the pods. Yes, you can get all the pods. Let us see if you can get all the secrets. No, he cannot get all the secrets. So this is how you identify which uh, privileges a particular user has got. And from here, being an attacker, he doesn't stop there. So what he does is like, 
he creates a cube config file. For this, I want you to all to download this script. So you can give this command, wget it will generate a config file. If you see config.sh, it is a small script, which will actually create a cube config file for us. It is actually getting like the IP of the config server and the token and certificates to access the cluster. Now we have that script. Now let us quickly run that script and save the output. All right, it is done. We have config now, cat config. Yep, there we go. It has created a cube config file for us. So this is like the user name, token, and this is the server IP address of the Kubernetes cluster. And now in order to perform any commands, we will be passing this cube config file like this, cube CDL, and we try to perform this thing. Get pods, yep. Get pods A, yes. Can he get secrets? Yes. Can he get secrets iPhone A? No, he can't. Get secrets iPhone A. No, the user does not have enough privileges to access the secrets across the cluster. But after performing a little bit of enumeration, the attacker, after trying different techniques, the attacker got to know that this user has privileges to impersonate some other user. So this is one thing which we have discussed uh, during like the basics. There is a thing called impersonation. You can always give uh, privileges or you can define different roles to different users saying that, hey, if you have like two different users, a dev or a DevOps or an admin, you can always say dev user along with these privileges. You can also impersonate as an admin or a DevOps guy, depending on his requirements. So by mistake, somebody has assigned an impersonate role to this particular user. And then the attacker, after enumerating a few things, he got to know, and he, he now he tries to impersonate as the group system masters, which means as an admin. So initially, we were not able to get the secrets, but now when the same user impersonates iPhone, iPhone as system masters, he's able to get all the secrets. So this is one of the bugs or one of the issues which we usually come across like the impersonation. They try to give like additional, additional uh, privileges to like unwanted users, unwanted privileges. Right, now that the attacker has enough privileges to get the secrets and pods and now he can do anything inside the cluster. Now let's move on to like scenario six. In the scenario now that the attacker now has gained, has identified that he can impersonate a system masters, which means he's ideally an admin. The attacker is now an admin inside your cluster. What he does is he further uh, enumerates the cluster and he identifies that there is a build server inside uh, the Kubernetes cluster. Usually the build servers are considered as like the crown jewels of any organization because they will have very high privileges to build or to deploy or anything. They also have access to like the code base, they'll also have access to the infrastructure, they'll also have access to like the web applications. So these are like very juicy targets for anyone. The attackers are always in the hunt of the build servers. If they happen to gain access to the build servers, the game is over. They have like unfettered access to the whole infrastructure. So what an attacker does, what being an attacker, what we do is, we try to list all the pods that are running inside the cluster and the attacker sees, and there are like some juicy pods like Cube API server, workshop dev control plane. This is the control plane pod, which gives like very uh, critical information about the cluster. And also there is something called a Jenkins build server. So now let us see and try and attack this Jenkins server and execute some commands into it. So that might be... There you go. Now we are inside the Jenkins build server. If you remember, we started with a web application vulnerability in the web application, and then we gained access to the underlying host. And from that underlying host, the attacker has identified that that particular service account has impersonate privileges as a system admins. And based on that privileges, we gained access to the build server, which is running inside the cluster. 
So we are like chaining different attacks. Now that we are inside the Jenkins server, we'll see what we can do. Again, needless to say, let us search for some environment variables. We may come across some juicy information. But there we go. There is something called secret password. It gives the host name. This is the Jenkins port. This is the Jenkins service. And there are some other information. And there is some token. And there is some critical piece of information. Username admin, password person. Now let's see how we can actually use this information. When someone gains access to any of the build servers, they always try to see like the different uh, folders or it could be like the build for folders where the job, different jobs are running. So the attacker after enumerating certain things, he came across a folder, a different job folder. Now let's get into the job, job folder and see what is there. And there is some config.xml looks like a juicy target and see what we have in this config.xml. Okay, it says this is like a Git repository and there's a Git host running here. This one. Cool. Now what we do is let us get into using like the token that we found here. And also this is the IP address of the internal repository. And this is the token. Let us see what we can do further. So what I'll do is, wow, it gives us when you enumerate the particular target endpoint or like the internal repository, it will list all the repositories that Codebase has. This is one of the repositories. We can clone them using this clone URL. And there is some other repository named Vasant. And there is another repository named Infra. There is another repository named backend. There is another repository named frontend. So all these things seems to be you know, juicy targets. In our scenario, let's uh, uh, target this repo. Now for that, let's get into temp. And inside the temp folder. So usually there will be like certain restrictions in most of the organization. In fact, in every organization, it's like a very basic restriction. Neither developers nor DevOps or system admins, they cannot merge the code directly into the master branch. Usually the process is like they need to create a dev branch. It needs to go some testing and they need to create a pull request. Some peer review needs to happen. It needs to get merged with the master. And that's when finally everything gets merged with the master. So attacker knowing these things, instead of he directly targeting like the master branch, he tried to target the dev branch of this particular one. So let's clone like the dev branch of this one. Okay, we are here. So this is the Git repository Docker file. Docker file is not a Docker file. It's like the name of the repository in this case. So I'm inside there. Git status, your branch is up to date. Now let us see what are the contents. It looks like this is a Docker file which the organization uses to build their internal Docker images. Now let's see the contents of the Docker file. It's a, for just for the testing scenario, I have given like a very basic Docker image which creates an HTTP. And what an attacker does is instead of uh, doing or creating the same image, he will try to create a malicious image. So let's remove this Docker file and let's pull a malicious Docker file, which I have hosted. You can use this command. Okay, the Docker file has been downloaded. Let us see the contents of the Docker file. The attacker is building some uh, from the base called evil image. So now let us check for the git status. And you can simply use the same commands, guys, as it is without any changes. Git add, the very basic git commands. You made some changes, you add, commit, and then push. All right. Cool. This time the commit is successful. And now let's push. In any organization, initially when a developer creates a push, it could be like the dev or any other feature pipelines. It will basically trigger a build. Now, it's the same thing which happens here. Now, at the very beginning, when I told you to uh, note down the IP addresses and the ports, other than the main Jenkins server, 
which is running on port 8080. We have an internal Jenkins server, which is running inside the cluster, and that can be accessed on port number 6767. And then you might ask me, hey, Basan, how does the attacker gets uh, or identifies the IP address? There are like different ways. For example, you can run commands like this, curl if config dot, which gives the IP address or using the environment variables, they can see the different IP addresses or the ports where the server is running. And there are also different ways to attack Jenkins build server and bypass the authentication. But to make, because attacking Jenkins or build servers is out of this scenario, uh, it made your life simple and you can access it using the username admin and the password wasant. And it says there is a last success build which happened 48 seconds ago, which means that is because of the push which we have made here. So after we pushed into the dev branch, it triggered a build and that has successfully run. And let us see what actually has happened. So build is successful and we have downloaded like an evil image. We have replaced an evil image. So it created an evil image and the build pipeline has been configured in such a way that every time it creates a Docker image, it will be pushed to their internal repository. Now in the scenario, what the attacker has done is he removed the existing Docker file. He downloaded a malicious Docker file and he made the changes to the dev branch. It was created, it was pushed to the repository with the name as in web app. Well, that concludes like the scenario six. So till now, what we have done is starting from like the scenario file, the attacker has gained uh, access to the underlying pod or the host using like a vulnerable web application using remote code execution. And then he tried to perform lateral movements by gaining access to a high privileged machine to the Jenkins server using uh, impersonation techniques. And from the Jenkins machine, he tried to identify some jobs and he downloaded some uh, clone the Git repository because the, usually the Jenkins server will have high privileges to the code base and to the infrastructure. So using those privileges, he downloaded like one of the clone the repositories. He replaced existing Docker file with a malicious Docker file and he triggered the build and that build has pushed a vulnerable or malicious Docker image to their internal repository. In the next scenario, what we are going to do is we are actually going to use that malicious image, whatever we have built or replace that image with one of the existing images in any of the deployments. So far we have done this. If you remember at the very beginning, we have done all the stuff from here. Initially, I created a reverse shell. I was listening on a reverse shell in my machine. And then you gain the reverse shell. And then you got into like the Jenkins machine and all the stuff. Just to make sure or to make the lives easier going forward, I want you to all to use exit of this one and use the same uh, VM for the rest of the things. It's pretty much the same thing. Let us assume the attacker has gained access and this is the machine where the attacker will be performing the rest of the operations. So let's move on to like the next uh, scenario, scenario number seven. Now, what we are going to do is we will see, the attacker will see what are the pods that are running inside the cluster. Let us assume he is still doing these operations from the Jenkins server. It's just to make the life easier and to issue the commands properly, we have moved to this machine, but still imagine that the attacker is still in the Jenkins machine. And now let us target one of uh, so when you target this one, we have a container or deployment or a pod running with something called the back. And if you look at what is the image that is being used by this pod, it says there is an image called Cloud Set Guy Demo Shell. This is the image that is being used by this deployment. Now, being an attacker, I will try to replace this image with the malicious image which I have built. So here I'm ideally creating a backdoor. So going forward every time, uh, if any of the DevOps or the internal people use that malicious image, will give like a wide access to the attacker. So let us see how this happens. So previously we have uh, used this command. If you want to see like, the deployment of anything, we give the iPhone OAML. So this will give us all the information like the manifestation, YAML manifestation of the particular deployment. So here, this is running with uh, 
image, some high humidity web app. So what I will do is, I will store I will save the output to an AML file. All right. Now, what I will do is I'll simply replace this image with the image that I have created. Now, let us replace this image with the one that the attacker has created. What is the image that attacker has built? It is from here. This is called as some web app. So let us replace that image with this one. And everything that we are doing is like a live workshop, live hacking. This is not something which have been built before because everything that is something which we are doing right now. So now the attacker also knows that he has built this container in such a way that it should, whenever this is run, it will connect, it will connect to a remote attacker on a particular port. So what I will do is. I'll also provide uh, these commands. I will provide some arguments to this container. Saying that, hey, connect to the attacker IP on port 7777. So here in this scenario, this is my attacker IP. Port one and port 7777, I've maybe been bashed. Before that, I would like to launch uh, netcat shell on my machine All right the netcat is listening control x save the file now what i will do is i'll simply apply it kubectl apply iphone f deployment it's configured now let us see what are the changes that's been happening it says this container is creating so once this container is created ideally we should see the attacker getting the access again to the internal pod so this way even if the attacker loses uh his access to the cluster every time someone deploys these images or this kind of configuration he will be able to gain access back to the cluster this is like creating a backdoor inside the infrastructure so let us see if it has been created or not yeah it says it's been running so ideally the attacker should have the access there we go the attacker has got the access you name my fna host name yep yeah, there we go this is my local host but then i was listening on a reverse shell and then the attacker pod that malicious pod has connected to the attacker and this is the pod which we have identified or changed so this is how the attacker will gain uh, can create some backdoors inside the infrastructure. And we'll also see in the next upcoming scenarios how to actually stop them. Let us look at uh, scenario eight. So let, in this scenario, let us uh, say that there is like a uh, Docker socket has been left exposed or like, let us assume like the Docker socket has been mounted to one of the ports where the attacker has gained access to. So let us see how this works in this scenario. And I'm sure I needless to say, I believe that you all know what a Docker socket is. If you're not sure what Docker socket is, do a quick Googling and you will get to know what a Docker socket does. And now let us see what and how an attacker can take advantage of a container where the Docker socket is mounted or exposed. Usually the Docker socket will be mounted to like the ports such as like your monitoring tools or log uh, capturing devices because they need to have access to the underlying host and see what's happening actually in the underlying host. So let us continue from here. Let us get into slash temp folder. Let us download this file and let us create a sample deployment. So here, what I'm doing is I'm like mounting like the Docker socket of the host onto the container and see what happens if we ever come across that container or what an attacker can do if they gain access to such containers. It 
this board monitoring created. Again, it's creating. Let's give it a few more seconds. Yeah, it's up and running. Now let's try to exec into this container. You can simply copy and paste this command. Kubectl exec. We are inside the container. Now let's get hacker of doing a little bit of research. After checking all the folders, all the files inside the container, he comes across a var run. And then so there is like some juicy target Docker socket has been mounted into this machine. So now that the Docker socket has been mounted, being an attacker, what I will do is I'll quickly add the Docker client onto this container. The Docker client is being installed inside a container. This is called also a technique Docker and Docker or DIND. The Docker client has been installed. Now what you can do is you can play with the underlying Docker node. You're actually inside a container, but because the Docker socket has been mounted, you installed the Docker client and you are actually playing with the container or with the Docker images which are hosted or which are running in the underlying host. Or if you, you can run all the commands, Docker PS. So if you look at these are the these are the images or the containers which are running on the host but then you're running you can see them from inside the container so in these scenarios what an attacker can do is he can the attacker can do is he can simply uh, log in into his docker account using your personal email address or the password and they can steal the images this is called exfiltration where the attacker can tag the existing images with their Docker Hub account, and they can push to their personal Docker Hub account. They can ideally steal the images. And after that, they can pull these images into their personal machines and they can inspect for uh, important secrets or any other stuff. This is called like the Docker exfiltration. So if you have like the username and password for your Docker login, you can try the stuff. You can uh, log in, you can Docker tag any of the existing images and you can push them. And after that, you can pull and inspect them from your local machines anytime. So you can try this one after the workshop. So let's move on to scenario number nine. So in this scenario, we will see how uh, someone can actually gain access to the underlying nodes by spinning up some pods. So in this scenario, we will simply run a small script and then we will try to gain access to the underlying nodes so for that. Let us exit from here. Uh, I'll quickly download the script. The script has been downloaded, the shell on node. I, I have like a small homework for you all. So here I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm simply running a pod. And I want you to find out what NS enter is and what NS enter does. If not, I'll explain you towards the end of the workshop. And I'm also running this pod with the privileges called privilege flag true. And what I will do is let us identify nodes. So if you ask me here, Basan, how will an attacker can identify the nodes that are running inside the cluster? You can, in any of the scenarios, like where we have seen where there is uh, anonymous user access given, or if there is an insecure port running, or if this is uh, there is a web application vulnerability, there are different ways if the attacker gains access to inside, they can uh, use these techniques to further distract the cluster. So let us target this one. This looks like a juicy target. Dev control, control is always a juicy target. So what I will do is bash dot slash shell, and I will provide the control plane node. And quickly, it should give us access to that particular node. If it takes some time, just, yep, there we go. If you look at, it says we can have got access to the control plane. And being an attacker, what I'll do is I will always try to search for some juicy information. Let's see, Kubernetes. Sorry, it's a CD. LS. And there is some juicy information such as like admin.conf, 
there you go you can grab the secrets and all the stuff from here or you can further get into the manifest folder and tree these are some important juicy files it will give us the complete configuration of uh, the kubernetes api server so and there are like a number of things that an attacker can do if they can gain access to the underlying host or the underlying node so let us exit from here Now let's look at the scenario number 10. And like we have discussed before, etcd plays a very vital role inside the Kubernetes cluster. If any by mistake, if the etcd is kept exposed or if somebody can gain anonymous access to etcd, let us see what they can actually do. We can start by, all right, there is an etcd client. Now use this command to enumerate and get some information from the etcd client. Yep, it says this is that these are the ports where it is running 2380 and 2379, which we have also identified during the port scan. Now let us try to get some secrets and see if we can access any secrets. There we go. The attacker is able to access some secrets inside the etcd client. And let us also try to grab some secrets and see Example, I can pass any of the one in this scenario. I'd like to pass some this Jenkins token or cube system. Yeah, I will pass this one. There we go. Like this, we can grab like the cluster information or the certificate or even the tokens. This is what happens. This is what which we have discussed before. If an attacker happens to gain access to the etcd client, we can further gain access to the secrets or the service account tokens and the game over. So I will leave it to you guys to perform certain things before. This is how you can access or you can do further uh, uh, privileges or do, do enumeration. You can assign the token. You can grab the token from here. And you can assign to an environment variable called token. And you also have like the IP address of the control plane. And then you can see what you can do with the privileges that you have got. Likewise, if you have time, you can go through all the secrets and see what you can do. And you can identify which secret or the token has got higher privileges. If the attacker happens to gain access to any of the token which has higher privileges, it's game over. Well, that concludes the scenario 10. Now let's look at scenario 11. Now, previously, we have seen how to gain access to one of the worker nodes, but if you want to gain access to any of the worker nodes randomly, if we have like multiple worker nodes, and if you don't know the names of the worker nodes, let us assume we have like uh, 10 worker nodes running inside the cluster, and if you can't, if you, if you don't know what are the names, you can simply do one thing. You can create a daemon set, which means which will create a privileged pod on each and every node. That is what a daemon set is. It will deploy pods on the number of nodes that exist inside the cluster. So you can simply download this one, this file, and just apply it and see it will create these things. All right, no problem. Let's try it. I will quickly download this one. Yep, it has created shallon node. What it does is shallon node. Right, I'm saying that just create a daemon set using this image busy box, a normal image, but I want it to be running with the privilege flag, with the privilege, high privileges. And I want to share like the host PID and the high PC and the host network. And I'm also like mounting like the host path. And now once if we apply this, it says the daemon set has been created. Now let us see the pods are being created. Yep, these are the ones which we have created. It says up and running. And now let us exit into this pod. So it will exit ID. Flash. 
There you go. We are inside the pod. If you search for the U name or host name, it says you are under the workshop dev control plane because this particular pod is hosted on this node. Likewise, if you want to gain access to like one of the worker nodes number one or two, you just need to exit into these things and you should gain, get access to directly to the underlying pods or to the underlying nodes. If you want to know the reason, hey, Vasan, how this is possible, how by creating a pod, how the attacker has gained access to the underlying node, we'll be discussing in the next steps. Ideally, the solution here for this one is like, if you look at, file, well, you are just uh, mounting the host path onto the container. That's the reason why he was able to gain access by gaining access to the pod. We will dis discuss this thing for the next one is another interesting uh, scenario. It's called performing crypto mining attacks inside the cluster. We'll be looking at this one along with the monitoring after a few things. And now we will jump on to like scenario number 13. Just again, a very important thing. So far we have seen like the attacking Kubernetes API server on secure port in secure port, uh, Kubelet read write read only or gaining access to the web server using some uh, vulnerable web application. But during these scenarios, there is a possibility that performing any of these things might get uh, triggered by any of the endpoint protection tools or any of the runtime protection tools. But now quickly after the attacker has gained access to the uh, Kubernetes cluster, what he will do is he will just clone or he will create a carbon copy of the Kubernetes API server. That way the attackers can avoid the detection. Have you ever seen like there are two Kubernetes control planes or Kubernetes control plane pods running inside the cluster? We will try to do it now. So we will try to get all the pods. So this is the control plane pod. Now, if you want to see the contents of this pod, CTL get pod hyphen n. So this is and this is like a very critical piece of information for the control plane. And because this cluster has been designed uh, intentionally vulnerable for the demo purposes, if you look at some important pieces, like there is an insecure pod which is open, which you are able to access, and there is an insecure bind address, it says allow privileged and authorization mode. These are like some important pieces that you need to keep in mind and the secure port running 6443. Now, what we will do is we'll try to clone the same thing, same YAML file with some changes. So I have already created that for you. You can just get it from here. All right, now there is carbon. Now let's see what that file has, the contents. Everything pretty much looks the same, but what I'm doing is I am just creating another API server, the carbon copy of the API server with an insecure port running on port 443. Because usually port 443 will be open to the world, to the public, and usually the firewalls doesn't monitor any traffic on the port 443. So I am creating and opening a port 443 insecure port. Now what I will do is I just apply This is a technique which I have learned from um, Brad Giesman, one of the most uh, well-known person in the cloud native security industry. And it says the shadow API server is being created. And once it is running, now that because we have exposed our insecure port on 4443, we should be able to access it. Oops, you can get POI for me. Yep, it says it's up and running and this is the IP address. So again, back to the basics. We have exposed an insecure port and port 443. There you go. You can access everything. Now there is no way, even like most of the tools can't even detect this thing because you're not directly targeting the main control plane, but you're targeting like the carbon copy of the control plane. Yeah, you can grab all the information. 
So, well, that concludes like the attacking uh, scenarios for today. And now we have like the defense mechanisms. We'll be going through how the rollback access works, network policies, the resource constraints, the security constraints, and the admission controllers work. And then we will look into like the monitoring stack. How can we monitor different uh, metrics inside the Kubernetes or how to identify the anomalies? And then we'll also be looking into brief phase security and runtime security. So before we start with the defense mechanisms, uh, I want I would like to give you all quickly a quick 10 minute break. Then we can gather in 10 minutes back. And meanwhile, if you don't want to take any break, you can just uh, simply continue practicing the stuff, any of the scenarios that you have missed. So do you all want like a quick 10 minute break or 15 minutes break? Any answer is appreciated. And should be good. And should be good. Okay, perfect. We'll catch up in 10 minutes. So, so all these scenarios, right? Like we'll mitigate it in the defense topics. Right, exactly. So I will uh, teach you like all the defense mechanisms. And initially, if you have seen in the Jenkins console, we have an option called proceed and abort. And towards the end of the workshop, when you click on proceed, it will create, it will, it will deploy another cluster, and then you can patch and you can practice these things. That way you will have like two clusters, one vulnerable cluster, one security cluster, you can practice all the techniques there. It is like an inception, everything is built using Docker containers, Kubernetes running inside the Kubernetes and all these things. Okay. All right, guys, let's catch up in the next uh, 10 minutes. Let's take a quick break. Welcome back guys, we will resume in a minute. I think, uh, uh, can we get this in the form of a PDF or a Word document? Yes, so on this page, at the top right hand corner, you should see like a PDF image, print image. If you click on print, you should be able to download the whole documentation, whole digital guide in PDF format. All right, okay. so in this yeah. difference uh, section, we will be covering a few things such as like a role-based access control, the network policies, resource constraints, the security context, and uh, admission controllers. So let us start with uh, RBAC. So this role-based access control is a key security feature that protects your cluster by allowing you to control who can access specific API resources. Uh, I want to actually start with a quote uh, attributed to an inspiring woman, Grace Hopper, who said like, it is often easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to get, to get permission. So in Kubernetes, everything is a resource. It could be pods, nodes, services, service accounts, and all the rest. But these resources don't have ownership or permission attributes. Instead, there are like additional level of abstraction, which are called roles and role bindings. So the roles uh, define rules that specify a set of resources and a set of verbs, which are actions that can be taken on those objects. But they say nothing about who can perform those actions. And this is where the role binding comes into play. A role binding links a role to an identity. This might be a user, a group, or a service account. This will complete that whole part. So the roles and the role bindings apply to a namespace. And there are also like cluster-wide equivalents called cluster roles and cluster role bindings. And uh, there is like second law of uh, RBAC. The second law of th thermodynamic states that uh, entropy increases over the time and the entropy of RBAC tends to increase over the time as well. Basically, I call this phenomenon as the second law of RBAC. We need to fight the tendency to grant too many permissions to too many players, just like you successfully overcame your urge to scroll down to the end of this book. So even though you have to jump uh, through like a number of hoops to configure specific permissions to different members of your organization in Kubernetes, it is well worth the effort. Like, I mean, uh, even if it is like painful to set up permissions correctly, it will be easier than asking for forgiveness if your cluster gets compromised due to like over generous uh, rollback. And the most important advice that I can give to anyone is like regarding RBAC, it's just use it. And uh, based on my experience or uh, based on like the security architects experience with customers have revealed, like there are like five or most common mistakes to look for in your RBAC configuration settings. It is like a uh, cluster admin role granted unnecessarily, like the scenario where we have seen giving uh, anonymous user a cluster admin role 
and then having unnecessary privileged roles or the improper use of role aggregation. It will be like unused roles or grant of missing roles. So now let's quickly jump into some RBAC demo and see how the RBAC actually applies and how we can make use of RBAC to limit the privileges inside the cluster. So for this, I want you to all to get into this location. Right, and now we have different scenarios. Let's get into RBAC. So like we discussed uh, for RBAC, we will have like two pieces like the role and the role binding. The role defines what a user can do, what actions on what resources, and the role binding defines to which user those attributes apply. So for that, let us start by creating a namespace to practice these things. So we have created a namespace and let us create two different users, a dev user and an admin user. And this is the command kubectl create service account dev user. Now let's create another command admin user. And uh, previously I have shown you if you want to impersonate a particular user, we use the command for life and FN yes. And the system service account, the namespace where the user belongs to and the service account name. And this is what we use for the dev user if we want to uh, impersonate a dev user. So I will quickly create an alias for you guys to make sure it is easy to issue the commands instead of saying kubectl and an rbac example along command, you can create an alias, simple like this, which means kubectl admin equal to kubectl and then rollback rbac an example, all the commands will be issued in this namespace. So likewise, I will create another alias for kubectl user. So any command that you run kubectl and user will be run with these things, kubectl and hyphen as, RBAC dev example in the namespace RBAC example. This is like shortening the command. So as an admin, we will try to get some pods. There you go. Because uh, the admin user have privileges and he's able to access all the pods. Now, as a normal user, kubectl and user, try to grab this is the same command. It says, no, this user cannot list resources pods in the API group at the cluster scope because he doesn't have enough privileges. Let us see if he can get pods in his namespace. No, he doesn't even have privileges to get the pods inside the namespace. <clears throat> now let's create some roles and role mining and then attach them to this particular user. Now there is a role called role get secrets. If you look at just cat, oh yeah, this is the role. So if you look at this one, we basically define the API version and the metadata where we provide the name and the namespace, and these are the rules. So in this one, we are saying we are creating a role called role get secrets, and this is the namespace where this applies to. And we are saying this applies to the resource secrets, the verbs list and get. So ideally what this means is anyone to whom this role is bound, they will have list and get privileges to the secrets in the namespace, our back an example. So for this, we need to create a role binding. So before that, let's apply this one. Oh, that is created. And now there is a role binding. So here I'm saying that I have created a role called role get secrets. The role called role get secrets has been created. And now I am attaching this role to the user, to the service account, dev and user in the namespace RBAC as an example. So now, kubectl, kubectl-f, the rule binding has been created. Now, because we have created a role and a role binding, which means the user dev should have privileges to access secrets inside the namespace. So if you give the command, there we go. Now the user dev has privileges to access the secrets. When we have tried before, the user doesn't have privileges to do anything. But if we can we see if this user has privileges to access the secrets, the cluster wide? No, he still doesn't have access uh, to access the secrets across the cluster because we have created or given privileges only for the namespace RBAC example. So this is how the roles and the role binding works. If you want to define any privileges at the cluster uh, at the namespace level, that's when we use a uh, role. And then in order to bind that role to someone, we use role binding. 
But if you want to give a wide access at the cluster level, then we use something called a cluster role and the cluster role binding. For that, I have created two more files. Let us see. So here, the only difference is we don't define a namespace, which means this will apply at the cluster level. And here we are saying that pods get most and list. So anyone to whom this cluster role is born, they will be able to get, watch, and list pods at the cluster level. So for that, we need to create a cluster role binding. So CAD. So this not now, this is the cluster role binding where the user service account dev user, we are binding the pod, the role pod reader, whatever we are going to create now. And this is at the cluster level because we are not defining uh, any uh, namespace. So let's quickly apply both of them. In CTL apply icon F. Now, the, uh, now this user, kubectl and user should be able to access pods across the cluster. There you go. So this is how we define the roles and the role bindings and roles and role bindings, the cluster roles and cluster role bindings play a very vital role in the part of Kubernetes security because that's where you actually define the identity and access management inside the cluster. So this is how you actually define and this is how you can restrict who can access what by defining the verbs and the roles of the cluster roles and then attaching them to the users or the service accounts. So in the very first scenario where there is an anonymous user which we have created and where we gave cluster wide access, it's because of this cluster role and the cluster role binding. So there is a section called extra miles and uh, we also have a file called I've created anonymous.yaml. Here, what I'm creating is like the cluster admin role I'm binding to system anonymous user. So I want you to all to try both these exercises and see what you can do. And also like the impersonate, this is another important piece which we have used inside the scenario, how this impersonation works. So in this impersonate, what I'm doing is, so I'm creating a cluster role in a role mining. A cluster role, I'm giving like the verb impersonate to the users and the groups and I am attaching this impersonate to the dev user. So after you apply these things, you will be able to impersonate the dev user as a cluster admin. So this is something which we have seen in the previous uh, scenarios, if knife and as. So I want you to try these things and the solution for these, both of these is in the same booklet. I want you to search this one. The next one is a network policy. Well, Kubernetes by default shows all pods to communicate among themselves for uh, simplicity. Like, uh, however, you can use network security policies and ingresses to enforce like a tiered architecture within the Kubernetes. In simple terms, like network security policies in Kubernetes are uh, analogous to firewalls to let or block the traffic. Now let's quickly review like the manifest file and try to understand how these network policies are actually built. And these are like some important features like policies are like namespace scoped, policies are applied to pods using the labels and policy rules can specify the traffic that is allowed to and from pods namespaces. And they all can also uh, define the protocols. Is it like a TCP or an UDP? And needless to say, ingress and egress plain English and default deny and allow is again like the plain English. I'm sure most of you are aware of this one. So let us look at some scenarios, how this network policies actually work, how we can restrict uh, traffic from one pod to another pod. And using this, how we could have restricted some attacks inside the cluster. So now let's go back to the previous location. Now there is a folder called network policies. There's a bunch of things. Now let us investigate one after the other. So let us start. <clears throat> have created something called network demo app. What I'll be doing for this demo is like, basically I'm creating a deployment, two deployments. One is like an, which consists of an API and the other one, which consists of an Nginx. And we will see how the communication happens between these two different pods and how we can restrict the traffic between these two and also how we can restrict the external and internal traffic to these pods. I 
I'll apply this one. Looks like some glitch. No worries. Let's keep going. It says, all right, pod API is up and running. Now we can also see like the Nginx pod. Right. We have like two deployments in Nginx, both are up and running. In the first scenario, we will see if we can connect to the outer world from inside the Nginx pod. So for that, what we do is We will exit inside the Nginx pod. And then we try to netcat Google. Yep, we are successfully able to interact with the internet. Now in the next one, let's try if we can access the API and other pod from inside the Nginx pod. Source temporarily unavailable. This is because of this error. Let me try one more time. It may cause some issue in my machine, but it might work in your machines. Uh, looks like this time it worked. It has deployed everything successfully. It should work. All right, deployment is up and running. Cool, all the containers are up and running. Now let us follow the same step from inside the Nginx. Let me see if I have access to the outer world. There we go. Yep, I can access the outer world. Also let me try and access if I can access the API service. Yep, this time I'm also able to access the API server. So at this stage, the Nginx service has access to outer world and can also access the uh, other, other pod API. And now let's also see if uh, the API has access to the outer world. And this is the pod. Yep, the API also has access to the outer world. Now let's also see if the API has access to the API Perfect. So at this stage, like the Nginx has access to the uh, public, uh, to the public world, also to like the API pod. Likewise, the API pod has also access to public world and also API. Now, using like uh, network policies, let's see how we can actually play with the network traffic and how we can actually restrict the traffic between different pods or to the outer world and external world. So in this scenario, what, what we are going to do is we are network policy for Nginx pods to allow only aggress to the internal API pods, which means let us see what this file says. Right. Here I'm creating like an aggress policy to the label API on port 3333, which means it should be able to hit like the API only on port 3333. 
and only the pods which has the label called app API and also to the DNS. So let's apply this one. Cool. And now let's see what kind of uh, access does the Nginx deployment has. Nginx, can it reach internet? No, it can't reach internet. Can it reach other engineering service? No. Well, let's see if it can access API on port 3333. There we go. So this is what the rule defines. It's saying like aggress to any of the ports which has the label app API and to the port 3333. That's the reason why we were able to access like the API service on port 3333. Now let's look at another scenario. This time I have created another file called Google 443. It says like ingress from Nginx on port 3333. And I'm also giving like the CIDR of this one, which is like the Google CIDR for your, it's, it's, it's for Australia, for your region, it would be like something else. Let me check, I think I can see three. That has changed, but yeah, what I will do is nano. Yep, has applied. Now, ideally, three galaxy API pod. This is my API pod. Let me see if I can hit no, you can't access. Now let us oops, I'm sorry guys, my port is different. This is the port, and I'm saying it needs to access only on port 443. No, I can't access it. Now let me try to access on port 443. There we go, it's open. That's how you can actually can play with ingress and egress rules and you can restrict the traffic. In most of the attack uh, scenarios which we have seen like attacking gaining access to the web application and then from web application gaining access to the Jenkins server, all these things could have been restricted by restricting uh, the traffic between the ports or the labels using these network policies. So after the workshop, I would like you all to try the rest of the things. And towards the end, you can click on proceed and it could take you to the production and the cluster. And then you can try all these scenarios, all the deployments there. Now let's look at another important uh, thing, which is called like resource constraints. Well, basically these resource constraints is where we actually define like the maximum memory constraints or maximum CPU constraints for uh, pods or inside a namespace. This actually defines what you can provide to a container or a pod, like the maximum amount of CPU or maximum amount of uh, memory utilization for any pod or for any container. We will look at this uh, defense now. And in the next later stage, we'll be looking at 
a crypto mining attack and then we will see how these defense mechanisms could have been applied to avoid those crypto mining attacks Let's quickly jump onto the demo. Let's get on to Although where it says memory limits, I have like uh, created different files for your practice. So let us start with this one. Let us see what this file says set limit range. There is an AML file which says set limit range. So according to this file, uh, when, whenever we create, whenever we apply this file, it creates a limit range where it is defining the maximum and the minimum CPU limits that are required for a container. So let us see what happens after we apply kubectl. Set limit range has been applied. And now we have another YAML file which says pod within CPU range. So I'm creating a, a pod by giving the CPU limits 800 and 500. It says the pod has been created without any issues. Now let's deploy another one pod with more cpu limits so remember we have limited to 800 max and 200 minimum but here i'm launching a cpu with 1.5 gig which is more than this and let us see what happens if we ever try to deploy these kind of containers by fnf there we go we received an error saying the pod is forbidden maximum cpu image per container is 800 m but the limit is 1500 m so this is how we can actually limit the usage of the resources inside the cluster that way the attackers they won't be able to perform uh, crypto mining or they cannot be able to max the resources and cause any denial of service attacks inside the cluster now let's quickly look at one more thing kubectl can we create a pod with the resources less than what we have defined. We have defined 200 minimum, but we are trying to launch a container which says like 200, 100. Now let us apply. There we go, it's the same error. Minimum CPU usage per container is uh, 200 M, but the request is 100 M. That way we can define what is the maximum and the minimum, or at least by default, how much a container should be having the resources that you can utilize inside a cluster. Uh, let's look at one last one. There's a set limit range. I will leave it to you guys to try this one. So here the set limit range is like maximum 800 and 200. I want you to try this and see how it works. It's a default.yaml. Yep, it says the limit defaults. This is the default memory request. I want you to try deploy this one and see what happens whenever you launch a container. One question was uh, in this case, uh, can't uh, the attacker actually set uh, it within that range and still create his container? And then it's fine. He can, he can still create a container within that range, but as long as he is not maxing the resources so that it won't cause any denial of service attack. Got it. Got it. it won't consume or the rest of the resources inside the cluster. The maximum he can consume is whatever you have defined in that particular namespace. Right, right. So it's specifically for DDoS attacks, it, it helps anyways. Exactly, DDoS attacks and also like crypto mining attacks. Like we discussed before, okay. uh, hacks are always not about just stealing the info. It is also about stealing the compute resources. Right. So this is the one which has actually happened with the Tesla hack. We will be seeing it in the next uh, scenario. So the hack happens. So this is something which we have discussed all the way for memories. But now I have also have an extra mile for you. I've created some files with the CPU limits. I want you to try these files and practice them. Uh, so Asan, this is based on the uh, uh, cluster or is it uh, in the namespace level? That's right, yep. 
the namespace okay. level. Name, namespace. Right. Okay. Now let's look at the security context. This is a very huge topic in fact, like uh, security context plays a very wide role in securely running workloads in your Kubernetes. And in fact, it's quite difficult. Well, uh, there are like many different settings which actually imp impact like security throughout the Kubernetes API requiring significant knowledge to implement correctly. Like one of the most powerful tools Kubernetes provides in this area are like the security context settings that every pod and container manifest can actually leverage. And basically the security context allows for the definition of the privilege and access controls on a per pod basis and a per container basis. These settings basically allow you to handle security settings of your process like the uh, kernel capabilities which can be restricted only to the container what user and group can your uh, processes run inside the container what linux capabilities you want your process have and how you can restrict um, es privilege escalations inside the cluster all these things will happen using like the security context there is like a huge uh, documentation for uh, kubernetes security context i want you to all The security context itself is altogether a huge animal. It will take days to define these things. So basically there are like multiple capabilities and this is how you define. This is like the best guide I ever came across to play with like the security context and the capabilities. So now we will, let's look at uh, one quick example. So here in this uh, scenario, this is how we actually define like the security context. So anything under directly here will be applied to the pod. Whatever you define could be run as a non-root, run as a user, run as a group, or a privilege escalation flag true, or uh, privileges flag false or true, everything can be applied here. But anything that is applied inside the container section will be applied to the containers. And one thing I want you to remember is anything that you applied inside the container will bypass whatever you have mentioned at the security context at the pod level. So whatever you applied here will be applying to the container instead of whatever you have defined at the pod level. There are like multiple flags that I want you to try, but this is like a very critical piece of information that I want you to remember. That's why we are looking at that scenario. But there are like different things that you can see like assigning CPU resources or uh, configuring run as a username or a pod. There are like different scenarios that you can play with here in the security context. So let's jump back and see our scenario. Now I'm creating a pod with these settings. The pod has been created. Ideally, I gave like the runners user 100 and runners group 100 and runners non root true. But at the container level, I have provided runners user 200 and see which one actually is considered by the container. CTO exec inside the pod. Here we go. Though I have provided as runners user 100, is running with the privileges UID 200 because they are provided at the 200 at the container level. This is a very critical piece of information I want you to remember because this is where most of the DevOps of the system admins will do the mistakes. And if you want to try like different flags, it's these are like the different flags that are available for this. And this workshop is not sufficient to go through each and every flag, but this is like the best place to look into. And we will look at uh, admission controllers. <clears throat> and um, if you're new, like these basically is admission controller is a mechanism by which requests coming to the Kubernetes API server can be intercepted prior to getting stored in the etcd. They are like part of the cube uh, API server binary. And using this admission controller, we can control the request coming to the Kubernetes cluster. Basically, these uh, admission controllers limit requests to create, delete, modify, or connect to. They do not support the read request. So, and uh, basically, if you look at the picture, it defines what it actually does. And there are like two types of uh, controllers validating and mutating. 
The difference between these two is that mutating webhook can modify objects sent to the API server to enforce custom defaults, while a validating admission webhook can reject requests to implement custom policies. So validating webhooks can only be used to admit or deny. So in this example, now different scenarios, we'll be looking at the validating webhooks. And for that, we use like the OPA. This open policy agent basically offers an open source service that can evaluate inputs against user-defined policies and marks the input as either uh, passing or failing. I mean, like any application or service that can be configured to make an API request for determining authorization or other policy decisions can integrate with OPA. Basically, OPA evaluates only whether a request confirms to the required policies. It is like mostly like validating webhook, either deny or allow. And basically this OPA is uh, written using a uh, Rego. Uh, users can write policies using this uh, language Rego. It is a, has like very simple syntax and small set of functions and operations optimized for query evaluation. So for example, OPA generates policy decisions by evaluating the query input and against policies and data. OPA and Rego are like domain agnostic, so you can describe almost any kind of variant in your policies. For example, which users can access which resources, which subnets aggressive traffic is allowed to wear, and which clusters a workload must be deployed to, which OS capabilities a container can execute with. So this is this acts like an additional layer of security inside the Kubernetes cluster. Though we have like uh, RBAC, or we have like scene security context or anything, but mostly OPA, this is where you can define certain policies as per the organization. If you have certain uh, privileges to be given to the dev team, this is where you can actually define, even if a DevOps or the system admins try to do or give additional privileges by mistake or intentionally, this additional layer of security will actually fall in place. This works as a gatekeeper. So now let's look at uh, some quick examples for this to work. You need to issue this command launch OPA stack workshop iPhone dev. This will set up all the requirements that are required for testing OPA. Launch OPA stack workshop iPhone dev. It says OPA stack launched successfully. In case if anyone has issues with it, just give the command called Tia and this one, and then launch it again. It will work. So it will basically deploy a few containers. Gatekeeper, let us give us a few more seconds for this to be up and running, and then we can continue with the scenarios. Are we, are we, are we on time? Yeah, we are on time. So while the deployment is happening, I would like to uh, touch base like two important points about OPA stack. There are two terms which you got to be familiar with, constraint template and a constraint. A constraint template consists of both a logic that enforces the constraint and the schema for the constraint, which includes the schema of the CRD and the parameters that can be passed into a constraint. I'll explain you in detail, I'll show you the file. The constraint is an object that says on which resources are the policies applicable. And also like what parameters are to be queried and checked to see if they're available in the resource. So let us check. Yep, yeah, our gatekeeper setup is up and running. Now let us get into this folder, OPA. And I have created so many scenarios for you to practice. So let us start with uh, a scenario called privileged containers. Let us get into privileged containers and see and start with template. This is the one which I'm discussing about, the constant template. So here in this constant template, we define the logic that needs to be enforced. Here I'm saying that I'm writing a small a violation message. If the security context has anything or a flag called privileged, just say privileged container is not allowed. Security context so and so is enabled. So after we apply this one, let us see if, if anyone inside the infrastructure can deploy any privileged containers in the infrastructure or not. So kubectl apply iphone f. It's been created, constraint template has been created. Now let us look at the constraint. We have applied constraint template. Now let us see what constraint is. 
it says, all right, we have created a constant template. And now we are creating a template, which actually says to which it should be applied, like on which resources are the policies applicable. So we are applying this policy, the template to the resources pods. And we are also excluding Kubernetes cube system. Now what this means is, CDL apply iPhone F. We have created now if everything goes well. Let us look at this file. So according to the policies which we have created, it should not allow us to deploy any container which has a flag called privileged. Now let us try and apply this one. Here we go. It says admission webhook validation gatekeeper denied the request. Privileged container is not allowed because this pod or Nginx has security context privileged enabled true. Now let us try to deploy another pod which doesn't have the flag privileged. We are marking the flag privileged false. Let us try if we can apply this one. It says it has been created successfully. That's because we are not launching a privileged flag. Let's uh, delete these things and move on to some other different examples. I have a question, Vasan. Yep. Uh, we created a template before, a constraint template, and we then applied a constraint right now. Correct. Um, so what is a constraint? I, I, can you uh, tell me what is the difference between these two files? Sure, yeah. The constraint template basically consists the logic that enforces the constraint. So here I have shown you the file. This is the constraint template. Here we're defining the logic. So the logic is if the security context has the privileged flag, make sure the privileged container is not allowed. This is like the violation and we are asking it to stop. So whereas the constraint is like, we are applying it. Constraint is an object basically that says on which resources are the policies applicable. So in the constraint, we are defining applied to the resource pods. So this constraint, we are creating like security context privileged and we are applying it to the pods because security context privilege can also be applicable to the pod security policies. Even when you define the pod security policies, you can define the flags, the security context flag. But in this scenario, we want this thing to be applied only to the pods. So that is the difference between the template and the constraint. In the template, we define the logic. And in the just the constraint, we define to which resources are they actually applicable. OK, thank you. That, that's all. Awesome. Now let's look at uh, another scenario. We have seen privileged containers. Likewise, you can try allow privilege escalation flag, and you can also like mention allow repositories. Now let's try the host file system. This is a critical, complicated one. This is one of the examples where we have tried like shell on pod where we deployed a daemon site and then we were able to SSH or exec into that particular pod and we gained access to the underlying host. That's because we were able to mount the host path volume onto the host. So we can restrict such attacks using this one. So we will see what the template is. It's a bit complicated. Here we are basically telling which paths can actually be mounted onto the container. Basically it says this allows slash foo, these can be mounted on the container, but this cannot be mounted. Let's try and deploy this one. It's been deployed. Now let's look at the constraint. We are saying like the constraint, again, we are applying to the pod and allowed host should only be slash four. So if you happen to launch any pod, 
with any other path host path mount. It won't let you to spin up that pod. Now let's apply this one. So this has been applied. Now let's spin up a pod. So here we are trying to mount our attempt. It should ideally deny deploying this pod if everything works fine. Let's see if I'll apply F and F. There you go. It's, it gives us an error message like host path, these things is not allowed. Allowed path is F O read only true. So I want you to find out a solution for this because we couldn't launch this one. Just identify a solution. What is the right one to actually mount this? Try to play replace this one slash temp with slash F O O and try to deploy and play with it. So these are like two examples for OPA. This is how like the gatekeeper actually works. Even if somebody tries to do some mistake knowingly or unknowingly, the gatekeeper policy will not let you to do any. Uh, unwanted things, unnecessary things inside the cluster. So after uh, playing with this stuff, I want you to all to run this command. Tier, OPA, hyphen, stack, so I can dev. So basically delete those containers. That's because that will reduce some um, space and CPU utilization inside the cluster. And I'm sure uh, you must be like well versed with the pod security policies. Pod security policies apply at or act as an additional layer of security with pretty much which works like an OPA. I'm not going to discuss much about the PSPs because they're going to be deprecated anytime soon but uh, it's, it's still like a valid thing that you need to be uh, looking into this stuff. And now let's get into like the monitoring. Well, you might be wondering like, uh, why are we doing this after all? A Kubernetes cluster has like uh, multiple components and layers and across each of them, we will find like different failure points that we need to monitor. And there are like some typical use cases for Kubernetes monitoring. It could be like uh, the cluster resource usage, for example, is the cluster infrastructure underutilized or are we like over capacity or we can like identify node availability and the health of the underlying nodes or uh, in, are there any like missing and failed pods or the pod resource usage against the requests and limits, all these things can be identified the monitoring. Monitoring plays a very vital role, needless to say, it would be like the Kubernetes infrastructure or the Docker infrastructure or any normal networking infrastructure. So let us start with some quick examples. So there are like different uh, stacks that you can actually open source stacks that you can actually uh, leverage to monitor your cluster. It could be like the EFK stack, which is like Elasticsearch, Fluent, or Kibana, which is used to ingest, visualize, and query from logs for various resources. And basically like the data in Elasticsearch is uh, on a disk as an unstructured JSON object, so the keys for each object and the contents of the each key are indexed. And in comparison, a low key is another source is like a single binary mode that can store data on the disk. And FluentD, I want you to all to read this, I'll leave it to you guys. But for today's uh, demo, we'll be looking at uh, like the low key Prometheus Grafana stack. Let us start with the installation. Installation is pretty straightforward. I have set up everything for you inside the cluster. Let's go to this one, cd slash root and you need to run this command, launch monitoring stack, workshop iPhone and dev. It will create the whole setup for you. Wow, that error has been encountered. So probably I'll give this a minute. All right, this time seems to be working without any issues. 
So if anybody has any issues while doing it, just issue the command clear in the same instead of launch and then relaunch it again. It will give you on uh, the which how to access the dashboard. This is the IP address and the port where you should be accessing the dashboard. And these are the credentials. Log in with the username admin and the password. This one usually takes a minute to do because it will spin up your whole uh, Prometheus Loki Grafana stack. Just give us a few minutes and make sure you copy these credentials somewhere so that you don't miss them. Just copy them into a notepad. And let's see. Yeah, it, it will take a few seconds. Just give it some time. Before you clear your screen, make sure you copy these credentials and also the IP where you should be accessing it. Still running. Let's give it one more minute. So before, while the stack is building up for us, I would like to touch a few things. Like in order to generate the Kubernetes audit logs, you need to enable the stuff. By default, it is not enabled. So when a request comes into like the Kubernetes API server, it can create one of the several different audit events, such as like creating a new pod or a service account. The service filters these events through an audit policy. And what is an audit policy? It is basically a set of rules that defines which audit event should be recorded and where they should be sent. So in interpreting your Kubernetes API or server audit logs, well, in addition to capturing the right audit logs, knowing how to interpret log entries is necessary for pinpointing flaws in your environment security settings. So at this stage, we are not just a monitoring only like the resource metrics of the nodes and everything, but we are all we will also be monitoring the Kubernetes events inside like the monitoring stack. And these are like key Kubernetes audit logs to monitor. Uh, there are like several techniques an attacker can use to access and modify Kubernetes resources, accounts, and services. And many of these techniques focus on exposing simple uh, misconfigurations in your Kubernetes environment or RBAC policies. So basically, these are like few techniques that can be used accessing to your Kubernetes environment, any changes to your Kubernetes resources, or the user and service account activity and the resource consumption. All these things can be identified uh, in today's workshop. Let us see if it is up and running. Yep, all the containers are up and running. Now I will access on the given port number. It's up and running and the username is admin and the password is which you have it on your screens. It's unique for each and every one. Here we go, this is the cluster. And the very first thing that I want you all to do is like download these two files. Please uh, run these commands from your local host, not uh, the VM is uh, or just copy and paste this URL in your browser and then save those files. If you just open them in your browser. Yep, just save the files on your local machine on your main host. Save both the files and what you should be doing is click on plus and then import and then upload both the files. And then make sure you choose this Victorial metrics Prometheus and then import. You have all these steps inside the club, inside the documentation. In case if I'm too fast, make sure you follow the documentation. There we go. We have successfully imported one. So let's import the other one. Let 
in the same, choose the Prometheus source, and then import. Go, it's all good. Just click on home, and click on this one, it will give us like different metrics. Now, what we are going to do is we play with some important metrics. Just go to this option, click on explore, and then make sure you choose like Prometheus or Loki. For Prometheus, you will be able to see different resources. And for Loki, you will be using the Loki as the resource. You will be able to see all the Kubernetes events. Let us start with this one. Oh, maybe let's uh, start with Loki. So click on log browser and then click on pod and make sure you always choose the Kubernetes API server dev control plane because this is from where the control plane we get all the Kubernetes events and make sure you change the time to last five minutes so that the search will be pretty quick. So this is how the Kubernetes events look like. The container or the namespace where the container is running pod and all these things. For example, we have tried a few things before, like uh, accessing like as an anonymous user of the cluster or grabbing the secrets and all these things. If we had this monitoring stack, let us see how we can actually identify that stuff. So for that, cool. let's do the same stuff which we have uh, done at the beginning. Get here. From their control plane. This is the IP address of my control plane. I'll try to access control IPS port 6443. I'll try to hit multiple endpoints API slash B1 slash pods nodes secrets. This piece of information is very uh, critical for anyone, for any uh, network monitoring or security monitoring or the SOC teams, because if someone, if some anonymous user is trying to access the resources inside the cluster, and if they come across any successful request, that is that could be considered as a compromise. Now, how do we actually identify these things here? For that, let us give a small, I'm writing a small query which says like, hey, uh, grab the logs which has the word keyword anonymous or and also the keyword secret. But before this, I would like to try this one. Just anonymous and which are like successful requests. There you go. It will list all the successful requests which have been performed by the anonymous user, which we have done since right from the beginning of the workshop. But here, because I have chosen last five minutes, it will show us whatever I have done a few minutes back. And now I want to see all the resources, all the requests where they try to access the secrets and which have been successful. So these are the few requests which we have sent just a few minutes back. Here I try to access the secrets. I have given some commands. These are the ones which are being displayed here user system anonymous and trying to access the resources called secrets. This is how basically you can identify uh, some stuff. And now let's try to grab something in the nodes. Anonymous user trying to grab the information of the nodes. There you go, user system anonymous, user system anonymous, resource nodes. And we also try to access the pods. So this is how we can play with different queries in the booklet. Now let's also quickly look at how we can uh, do some activities at the resource level. For example, if you go to Prometheus and you have like different metrics which comes by default, it would be uh, all the metrics related to Kubernetes API server, see all the admission control, the duration, or the different number of audits in total, 
or audit uh, level total you have like some juicy information which can be grabbed uh, from here or uh, watch events total there are like n number of things that you can try from here so and next you can go to like the container get some information about like the network transmission that's been happening on the containers or the cpu period or the cpu load or the memory limit that's been being consumed by different containers like this is a huge piece of information and for example let's quickly take some examples and if you want to see like the memory consumption host memory consumption on any node so this query will give you like the memory like the host memory consumption of the nodes this is the value here likewise if you want to see like the cpu consumption of the nodes this is the query i uh, i definitely can't get in depth at this stage because in this four hours duration this uh, monitoring plays a very vital role and it's altogether a different animal so i will i'm like trying to give you some gyan on like the, all the basics all the critical piece of information that you can gain from monitoring and then you can play with it and you have like different scenarios that you can try from here and for example if i want to find out like the utilization of the containers this gives like the utilization of all the containers and also i can create alerts if something happens or if some anomaly happens this is how we can actually create an alert for example i'll create a notification channel so i create workshop and i'll try to use slack for the example because that's like the most easiest one and i will provide the url i have a webhook which i have created for the demo and test notification sent so if you look at uh, the test notification has actually been sent uh, can you all see my screen hello yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Perfect. Cool. So that is. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now I have created notification channel. Let's create some test dashboards. First dashboard. Let's create an empty panel. So I will choose Prometheus as the one. I will give a query where it says if the host memory is beyond something. The host memory utilization is beyond thirty give me an alert and let's create an alert create alert every one minute then for, i want it to be like every one minute between the previous minute is below 40 If the CPU utilization is like below 40, just send me an alert to where? To the channel that we have created and the message. CPU, oh, it's basically. CPU utilization is high. Then panel title, CPU. And there are like different visualization things that you can actually try. It would be like a graph or it could be like a stat, or it could be like a gauge. You can try different things, but for this one, I'll go ahead with graph. Click on save dashboard. Cool. Now let me create one more thing. Empty panel. This time I'll create something for uh, memory. Prometheus. No, actually, this is like this is the other way. So, the alert and pretty much the same. You can do whatever you want to try. Craft, create an alert. One minute.
right? And uh, previously we were discussing about uh, a scenario where we'll be looking after the crypto mining attack. So we will look after this crypto mining in this scenario, what happens actually in the crypto mining and basically how we can actually identify crypto mining in the monitoring stuff. So for this, I want you to all to download this YAML. Just paste this command, it should download crypto.yaml. Let's see the contents, what we have inside the crypto.yaml. It's basically like an attacker doing some crypto mining. These are the commands which he has issued and this will be doing the mining for him. He has also defined like the memory limits and the CPU to ensure it, they are like another limit so that it won't get detected. Now apply this one. If you're trying to just make sure you don't run it for more than a minute, there are chances that it might crash the computer. Now, if we actually look at, okay, let's go back to here, home. Dashboard. So let us open this one. Everything looks well and good. Everything is like green. Your CPU utilization is under the limit your partitions, or it could be like your uh, download and upload, everything seems to be under control. But let us see what happens in the next few minutes now that we have deployed the crypto miner. And again, make sure you don't run it for more than a minute if you have deployed it to on your cluster. There you go, it started with orange here. Let's wait for another 30 seconds. Let me refresh. Let's wait for another 30 seconds. You will see how uh, quickly the crypto miner will start consuming the resources inside uh, your worker nodes. Well, it says like CPU is turned to orange and memory utilization has been turned to orange and the disk write operations have been turned to orange and they have been increased a lot, the download and upload. Just keep observing like the memory utilization and the CPU utilization is being increased. But while this happens, I would like to delete this image, otherwise it will consume more. And before that, I would like to show you the stuff. Let us get to the explore. And if you want to see like what's actually the crypto is doing, go to like the metrics and choose Loki, the log browser, choose pod, and then go to the, choose the pod miner, the show logs. It will show you like what's been actually being done by this particular pod. I will leave it to you to explore and understand what this is actually doing. But for now, I would like to release this pod quickly. Oops. And like previously one, someone has asked me this question like, hey, Basan, what if somebody gives or launches the container within the limits of the defined uh, CPU and memory limits? So this is what the attackers are basically doing. This is what actually happened with the Tesla attack. They made sure like they launched crypto miners with very minimal CPU and memory utilization. So that way, even like the monitoring tools could not detect it for many days. So now that we have stopped, everything is coming under control. The CPU utilization got down to 36, 35, and the memory utilization is coming down. 
So basically, this is uh, one of the use cases where monitoring plays a very vital role, the utilization. And using this uh, things, you can identify these kind of memory attacks. And also, uh, because I have created some alerts, I keep receiving some alerts in my Slack channel. Like if you look at, these are the alerts, CPU utilization high, CPU utilization is high. And it says like memory utilization is high by which container. And then this is how you keep receiving the alerts. And once everything is normal, you keep you get an alert saying that, okay, it's, everything is under control. Now let's look at some other interesting logs. Let's get to like explore and locate our browser or like anything that is related to Kubernetes control plane, you will get the logs from here. So you'll have like multiple uh, a number of logs and uh, different fields for you to explore. So if you go back to the workshop, this one, let's try last few more rules. This time let's try to identify any anomalies inside the Kubernetes events. Now that we have seen like uh, issues with the resource utilization and other things. Now let us see what if some uh, anomalies happen inside the Kubernetes cluster, like someone anonymous user trying to access something or creating secrets or exit something, these kind of things. I think we have around 45 minutes more for the workshop. Come, come, come. It's taking a little long to load the page, guys. Let's give it one more second. Uh, there are like few other important things that in case if you want to try, this will give you information like the pod container info, we give all the information about the containers. It will give you information about the node created, when was the last time it was created, information about the secrets, or if you want information about the kubelet. tell you like number of containers running on each and every uh, node. So like some important queries I have given you. And if you want to type total number of namespaces. It will give you, it says like there are total nine spaces which are inside the cluster. So even here, you can define some alerts. For example, by default, if you know, hey, these are the namespaces which we agreed to be deployed by the deployment team. And by default, if you know they are nine, and if by any chance, if somebody happens to create another namespace, you can immediately receive an alert. Likewise, if you have limited number of uh, deployments or anything, you can immediately get an alert. Now let's look at some interesting examples. So let us write a query. So this is something the stuff which we have seen before, like if you want to identify like the anonymous users accessing secrets or uh, the number of uh, anonymous user accessing pods and nodes, and then like a number of use cases, there is like no limit for you can go to any extent, but these are like few examples. So this is pretty much about like the monitoring stack. I want you all to try all these commands and different alerting techniques and mechanisms. And setting up the stack is very straightforward. You just need to launch one single command. Now let's move on to like the build phase security. 
when it comes to like a Kubernetes security, there are like three phases, like uh, build phase security and the deployment phase security and the runtime phase security. So, so far what we have seen are like the deployment phases, like ensuring we have uh, good containers up and running. We have good role, role based access controls. We have appropriate network policies or we have like secured security context applied. All these fall under like uh, deployment phase. But now whatever we are going to see is like called build phase uh, security. Well, it's because uh, a big part of any organization's risk assessment process is to be uh, aware of and gain visibility into vulnerabilities in the software being used. And these vulnerabilities can be categorized into two uh, different formats, are like known vulnerabilities and unknown vulnerabilities. And uh, unknown vulnerabilities are something like zero days or which cannot be simply detected by the existing vulnerability scanners or the tools. And from an attacker point of view, having known vulnerabilities is very bad to leaving the organization doors and windows wide open because the exploits are readily available. And this is the reason why we use vulnerability scanning. And vulnerability scanning is like an organized approach to the testing, identification, analysis, and reporting of the potential security issues on a network. And this vulnerability scanning is very safe. It's like non-destructive non -destructive form of testing that provides like immediate feedback on like the security of the container images. So this is uh, something which we actually perform the vulnerability scanning on the images that we build or that we use. So this can also actually happen at two phases. One is during before actually deploying the image, you can run the image. You can scan an image and if there are like any vulnerabilities, you can patch it. Or there is also possibility that after you deploy the image, somebody might uh, discover a new vulnerability and that vulnerability might exist inside your image. That's why you need to also perform a runtime security scan. So now let's look at some build phase security scanning. And uh, for this one, you can, there are like multiple open source tools. You don't need to spend even a single buck. And today we are going to look at a tool called Gripe, which I personally use for scanning the images inside the cluster. And you can deploy Gripe using one single command. Why is it taking so long? <laughs> right, I have the command in my notes. I'll quickly use that one. So the command for you to launch this scanner is available in the documentation for some reason, it looks like the instance is not responding, but you can install it one with this one command. It's pulling like the gripe scanner, cool. it's installed. Now what we are going to look at is we are scanning, we are going to scan a couple of images inside the host. So if you issue the command docker images, these are the containers which we have inside the cluster. Now let's try to scan this one. Just need to grab the image ID. It's as simple as pass the scanner name and the image, that's it. In the next one minute, you should have all the vulnerabilities that exist inside your container image. Let's give it a second. image. Let's wait for one more minute.
So the scan has been completed. And if you look at, we have like these mini vulnerabilities, like close to 104 vulnerabilities inside this container image. And we have like close to 160 packages inside uh, this thing. So this is how we actually use to identify the vulnerabilities. Now let's try one more thing. Let us scan maybe this one. That's the same image, Justin. I'm sorry? I think that's the same image. So uh, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. So we can. So once you find the vulnerabilities, right? Like, uh, did uh, does the tool give options how to go about fixing those? Uh, trust me, so far, not any tool based on my experience will actually give you the solution. They will always give you the reference to these pages called CVEs. And so you need to get into those page, identify which package is actually causing that issue. And then you need to look after whether do you really need that package inside your Docker image, if not remove it, or if possible, see if there is any new package which does not have that vulnerability. And then you need to uh, like actually uh, create a new image based on it. This is like a very big okay. challenge, even like uh, multi-billionaire companies, like multi-billionaire companies will also face these issues. And there is like no appropriate solution. The only solution people follow is like they build uh, in-house inbuilt images or they use sometimes wherever possible, they build images, something called uh, from the scratch, or they use some multi-stage uh, builds. There are like different ways to actually reduce the bugs, but there is no way one can say, okay, this is like vulnerability free image. You will always have some of the other vulnerabilities inside your container images, unless it is a scratch, which does not have an operating system. Basically, this is how- What sorts of tools uh, uh, will uh, some, uh, something contender you use, Spring-based tool, Spring Boot, or anything, you might have something. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like every time you scan a container, you will have some of the other vulnerabilities. And always remember one thing in mind, here we are scanning like the container image, which, are, which we are like scanning actually the underlying post. But there is a possibility that after you give the image to a developer, the developer might deploy his code which will have like more libraries in stock uh, with coming up with the code. And even that code might have some vulnerable libraries. And for that, you need to use a different tool which will actually scan for the vulnerabilities in the libraries. So these are like two different things. Scanning like vulnerabilities for the host or the Docker image is different from scanning for the vulnerabilities in the code that you're using. I think uh, uh, vulnerabilities in the code you should do first before you build the image, right? That's the sequence. Uh, it's It's, yeah, they're like two things like, see, this is how it works. The DevOps team will create like the images, they push it to the repositories and then the developers will pull those uh, images and then they deploy the code onto it. There is nothing like this needs to be done first. Okay. There, there are SAST and other DAST kind of scanners, right? Like uh, different tools. Exactly. So they are again SAST and DAST. They fall under like the application security. The SAST is called like static scanner, which will scan for the vulnerabilities in the code format, whether are you following like appropriate input validation, sanitization uh, for these kind of things in the code. And the DAST works like the dynamic thing as if an attacker is attacking your machine once the whole deployment is done. So SAST is different, DAST is different. And this kind of Docker container image is different, and the vulnerability yeah. of the network is different. Runtime security is different. They're like multiple things. Yeah, you know, the, is there any uh, good uh, uh, paper or something? See, there is a sequence, right? See, uh, developer checks in code, and then we got to do as probably a SAS scan first, right? Yeah, and exactly. then once that is done, you have to build the image, uh, right? And then probably scan for your image uh, vulnerabilities, right? Like what is what? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, 
just quickly give me one minute guys for some reason the documentation is not loading i'll just refresh my ec2 instance and uh, guys in the next uh, scenarios we'll be looking after like the runtime security which is again a very important module and then we will be looking at some tools of trade uh, just give me like a five minutes break i'm a little tired speaking for the last four hours uh, let's catch up in the next five minutes please is yeah. that all right yeah cool sure all right, guys, let's resume. <clears throat> Is everyone here? Yes, for some. Okay. Yeah. So we have covered till the container scanning. And these are like some other open source tools which you can use. One is like the Trivi, the other one is Clear. They are like pretty much do the same job. It's just uh, the uh, UI might change a bit, but pretty much they use like the open vulnerability database and check them against the packages that pretty much do the same stuff. Now let's look at the runtime security. <clears throat> it's, it's basically like runtime security means vetting all activities within the container application environment from analysis of container and host activity to monitoring the protocols and payloads of network connections. You know what, uh, basically what kind of problems does this solve the container runtime security in the, Build phase security, we have seen like how to secure the Docker images, identifying any vulnerabilities even before they get into the cluster. And then we have seen deployment phase security where how we secure like the role-based access control, security context and everything. And this is like the runtime security when actually the cluster is deployed and when all the operations are being done. So what kind of problems does it solve? Are my hosts and containers doing something they shouldn't be doing, like building runtime models and monitoring for deviations? and identifying any spawn processes like did my postgres sql container spawn in unexpected process or file system reads and writes did someone install a new package or change configuration in a running container or network activity did my container open a new listening port or unexpected outgoing connections or also like did a kubernetes user spawn a shell into a privileged container these kind of things so let's quickly set up the last uh, runtime security stack for the day so we just copy this command. This may take anywhere close to one to two minutes to bring up the stack. And in case if you guys are following, please provide a Slack URL. Even if you don't have a Slack URL, that's absolutely fine. You can just press enter and go without providing any URL. But if you provide a Slack or it will continuously send you the alerts. And also this is like the URL from where you can see different types of events in, in a browser other than Slack. Just give it a couple of minutes for it to be up and running. So just copy this URL. Now, what all uh, uh, hacks that we have been doing right from the step one, it could be like uh, creating reverse shells or uh, uh, running netcat or executing into different containers or doing some access and secrets unwanted stuff. All these things can be identified by a runtime or security checks instantly and immediately. Let us see that in action, how it actually works. So let us see. Oops. Oh, it is still pending. Let's give us one more second.
I may have to play with this a couple of times. Something is wrong. Just give me one more minute. It should be fine. In case if you are running simultaneously, you can simply run it using this command. <clears throat> then you can run this YAML file to generate some events and in order to monitor or you can like exit into some of the containers. We will try it hands-on. Oh, it's all good. Looks like it is. Uh, what's wrong? Looks like I'm out of space. I'll quickly delete some containers. Play with me one more moment, guys, and set it up.
There's something wrong, it's not deploying. Uh, let's try one last time. If that doesn't work, we will move on with the next scenarios and come back to this at the end. Uh, sorry guys, for some reason, this doesn't seem to be working as expected. We will come back in this one in a while. Let's move on to like the next scenarios, like the tools of the trade. So these are like uh, some important tools, which uh, any uh, DevOps or anyone who actually uses with Kubernetes needs them in their arsenal. So let us start with K9s. K9s is like basically provides a terminal uh, UI to interact with your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, the aim of this project is to make it e easier to navigate, observe, and manage all your applications. And setting it up is like very easy. Just run these few commands. And this is one of the best tools that I came across uh, playing with Kubernetes and very handy, very useful CLI. Yeah, it's all done. Now launching this tool is like very simple. Just run K9s. There you go. It gives you like a very, this looks like a web application, but it's like a UI, it's CLI, and it's very user-friendly. It will give you all the information about the pods, deployments that are running. And if you want to see uh, different nodes, just type nodes. But if you want to see pods, you can type pods. If you want to type daemon search, search for daemon set. So this is the one which is not being deployed. Not sure why, what the error is. Or oh, we can just go with logs. No, logs are not coming. And describe. Ah, it's because we have created some constraints before where we have uh, created like the minimum CPU usage per container. That's the reason why this is not being deployed. So I will quickly slash root slash code base files ls cd memory limits Right, so let's get back to the tool. Now let's see. So here, this is how we actually use like K9s. So if you want to see the secrets, you can access all the secrets. Or if you want to see the pods, and if you want to see logs of any of the pods, 
just go to there and just press L. It will give you the pods. So if you look at this section, it will give you all the shortcuts. Like for example, C, copy, mark, all these things. And here, if you want to do some port forwarding or if you want to get a shell, you can get a shell or you can edit, describe, delete, attach, kill. You can perform all the commands from here. This is like a very handy tool. So let's move into... Let's try one last time. Yep, this time the runtime security stack is up and running. Let's give us one more minute and also let's cover that scenario. And in case if you're trying, make sure you note this IP address. This is where you'll be looking at the different events. Well, this is the dashboard. Now let's create some events for some test events just to ensure the setup is up and running. Uh, let's wait for a few more seconds. Once this is up and running, it will all be set. We are very much on time. We'll be finishing up in the next 10 minutes. So. creating maybe one more minute. And just for the demo purpose, I'm like using Falco. There are like many other open source tools that you can use. Once if these, one of them is running, we are all set. Usually this is a bit uh, heavy image. Yeah, it was killing my CPU when I was starting it. Yeah, this is a little heavy image. QBC underscore PO. Oh, it says started container tool, then it should be all good. Yep, it's all up and running. Now, if you guys access the browser, yep. So this is how the UI looks like. In case if you happen to give Slack channel, you can see the alerts in the Slack. 
it says already there is a privileged container has been launched some sensitive mount container or the pseudo set uid now what we are going to do is we are going to run some test events using this job let's go to the yep event generator created now you should see some traffic that is being generated Even it will take like a minute to download that event generated image and generate the events. And meanwhile, what we can do is we can just uh, do some stuff like executing into one of the containers. You'll see the exec, then ID, or just for uh, testing, we can run something like netcat, or we can create a file, some echo test txt all these things needs to be flagged as an anomaly so if you go yep yeah, there are like 20 events now if you want to see what the events are you can click on events and it will give you all the information for example whatever we have done right below root we have written some files and we have launched a command called netcat and it says some suspicious network tool in the container has been launched and it also says when we exit into the container it says like some shell has been executed into the container you will get all these of images like there is like a privileged container that has been launched like a number of alerts you can actually configure and get it in the way you want so this is pretty much what a runtime security does even if you have if you somebody like launches a privileged container or if somebody launches a container with sensitive host path mount, or if somebody launches like a suspicious networking tool like Netcat or something else, or if somebody performs like privilege escalation, or if somebody tries to run some exploits inside your infrastructure, or if somebody even tries to gain access to the shell or executing into the container, all these things will be alerted immediately to the security team. This is called like runtime security. Anything that is happening during the runtime will immediately be alerted to the team. So this, I want you all to try different things. Like everything that we have done in the attack scenario, just try them again and see if you can actually see the alerts. And if you actually see the alerts, how you can use like the defenses that we have seen and how to uh, like defend them. You can try it in the another cluster. I'll tell you, uh, like I showed before, when you click on proceed, it will create like another cluster. I'll try to how to access it. So we have seen canines. Now let's look at the another tool called Popeye. So installation of this tool is like pretty straightforward. I think it's done. Now just run Popeye. It will basically scan your cluster for all the things and it will give you like what is good, what is bad. It will scan for your uh, roles, role binding, secrets, cluster roles, cluster role bindings, all these kind of things. It's very simple and very lightweight. And you can also try two other tools like Cube Audit and Cube Bench. <clears throat> there is one more interesting tool called uh, uh, Cube Striker. Basically, I'm not going to give. Uh, I mean, let us see like what a Cube Striker does. Basically, Cube Striker is a platform agnostic tool, and there is a website for it. It's called CubeStriker.io. So there is like a documentation page for it. And basically, I started building this tool somewhere like uh, towards end and mid of 2020. And CubeStriker performs numerous in-depth checks on range of services and open source and Kubernetes platforms. It will like scan self-managed and cloud provider managed Kubernetes infrastructure. It performs various checks on open ports, or it performs like automated enumeration in case of the insecure port and other ports are open. Performs both authenticated and authenticated scans. It will perform scans for a wide range of IAMs configurations in the cluster. So there are like two types of uh, variations. One is like command line interface, and the one other one is web application. So command line interface can be installed pretty quickly. Don't even need to install it, just spin up a container and you should be able to do it. So this is like the documentation. And if you want to install it, this is the command. And if you want to run a web application version, this is like the architecture of the web application. Like it has like a front end, which is written in Angular and the back end uh, writing in Python. And you can deploy Cube Striker using three files, either simple Docker Compose or YAML or Helm. And basically, you 
it's Riker for various platforms. You can scan EKS, self-manage, AWS, GKE, or whatnot. So this is how the UI looks like. And it can also be integrated with the CI CD. So every time you create some deployments in your dev, or even before the deployment happens into the production environment, you can use this tool in your CI CD pipelines and identify any issues even before they made it to the production. So I'm still developing this tool much further. I have like so many uh, things like integrating it with some other tools, such as like ticketing tools. I'm working on creating some continuous scanning, monitoring and alerting tools, all this stuff. And CubeStriker has been in some various conferences. And this is like the GitHub page for this. GitHub.vgnipoli slash CubeStriker. So make sure you start this page so that you will get constant uh, updates like whatever I'm updating, whatever things I'm giving. The reason why I didn't show this one in the demo is because I don't want to publicize in my workshops, but it is like very straightforward to use and very, very user-friendly and very uh, highly capable of scanning like the Kubernetes clusters. You have two versions like command line interface, looks like this and the web application interface. You can use either of them. And if anybody wants to contribute, I'm like more than happy. Your contributions are welcome. So that is pretty much CubeStriker. So we have covered the Kubernetes basics. We have covered different attacks. We have covered different defense mechanisms. We have looked into the monitoring stack using Prometheus, Grafana, and we have seen like container scanning and we have performed runtime, basic runtime security using uh, Falco it is like continuously generating some alerts you can actually go here to the events and see why it's actually an alert and we have covered different tools we have seen canines we have seen popoy we have seen cube striker and we have seen like different real world attacks and hacks so what you can do is you can pretty much click on proceed now it will deploy another container the only thing that you need to do is in your machines you need to create an alias, something like now kubectl equal to kubectl iphone iphone cube config. Just need to change this dev to prod. And you're like all set to play with the production cluster. So, or basically, you can do something like this: kubectl iphone prod equal to like the prod cluster, and kubectl iphone dev equal to like the dev cluster. So, basically, you have like you no know, two clusters: one is dev cluster, the other one is prod cluster. So whatever defense mechanisms we have seen and whatever attacks we have done, you can actually keep trying that stuff. I can give you the solution straight away, but if you like look at the solutions, you won't be able to learn. And until unless you do something hands-on, you won't learn much. But if you want solutions, you can always reach out to me. I will give the next one to two days, but I want to make sure you try something before you reach out to me to the solutions. So you have like two setups up and running. It's like an inception started with a Docker container and inside a Docker container, we have like a Kubernetes cluster. Inside a Kubernetes cluster, you have a Jenkins image and then two Kubernetes clusters. It took a lot of time and effort to build this infrastructure. And pretty much you can download the documentation from here by clicking this image. And yeah, that's pretty much concludes the workshop today. We are on time and I'm like happy to take any questions if you have. In case if you have learned something, just let me know, hey, Basan, this is good. Or if you need any improvements for the next workshops, I'm like more than happy to take your suggestions and make them. But like I said, I had to cut down most of the content to ensure we cover most of the stuff in the four hours. Because Kubernetes is a wide animal and looking after like real-time security, runtime security, and uh, deploy for security is pretty huge. But we have covered very decent stuff. We have done some hands-on attacks in the, in the four hours, whatever we have. So, and you guys can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. So you can find me here, Vasan Chinipili, and you can connect with me here.
Yep. And also, if you like the workshop, just write a quick feedback wherever you can. And if you have any suggestions, you can always give me pass on the suggestions. Cool, guys. That pretty much concludes the today's workshop. Thank you very much for joining the session and thank you for being very patient. And yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Uh, hey, Vasan. Yep. Uh, hi. So I'm, I'm Arnav actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm actually a student. Hey, you right? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah sure. So I'm actually a fourth year student. Mm -hmm. And uh, a quick background about me. So I'm currently working as an intern in uh, a company called CloudSec. Yep. And uh, so I'm I have some certifications like OSCP and all that. But mm -hmm. okay. Yep. But I'm interested in uh, cloud actually. I'm trying to de dive deep into the uh, cloud concept and all. Yep. So my question is, uh, I'm more I believe my work responsibilities this is a career based question. I hope it's okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm more into, I mean, my work is more into uh, application security, right? It makes sense. So how, excuse me? Yeah, that makes sense because I, I know what you're meant to ask. I have been in your situation a few years ago. Uh, I have done my OSCP somewhere in 2012 and 13. I think it's been close to eight, nine years. I was like uh, doing some monotonous work, like doing only penetration testing. Oh, but okay. then I was even I was wondering like how to learn cloud security, how to get into different stuff, or how to learn Kubernetes containers and other stuff. The only way to do is like learn, just learn. You know, I'm I'm finding the learning part, so I am learning. Yeah. But how do I make the switch? Is what I'm wondering. Because uh, uh, all uh, job descriptions, right? Yeah. We see that they require experience, something. Exactly. Right. So talk to your boss and ask him to put you in some projects where you can actually penetration or do some penetration testing on Kubernetes and cloud environments. And uh, see, I always give one advice for any of the security uh, professionals or the beginners. Before you want to break or penetrate anything, you should actually learn how to build it. For example, if you, you said you are like an application security specialist, in order to attack and break the application, you should also know how the application works and how the people have built it. And that's when you can actually explain uh, to the developers what the mistake they have done and how they have actually how to actually correct it likewise if you want to learn cloud and container security you'll have to start building it create your own cloud account there are like so many open source uh, i mean i don't say open source there are like many uh, giving like free credits where you can use with azure or gk or cloud start actually deploying your things start configuring different things learn how to how the security repos what cloud works what are the things that actually work and then start breaking them and then you, and trust me, you don't need experience. You just put them in your resume and tell them, hey, this is what the stuff that I have been learning. I'm like an actually beginner, but they're like, people are open to give opportunities always. And to your question, like talk to your boss and ask him to put you into some Kubernetes or cloud security penetration testing and ask him to provide some resources. If you're exclusively working in a penetration testing consultancy, then it might be a little challenging for you to work with some other teams. But there are always like startups and meetups, conferences like this. And these days, like um, A Cloud Guru and all these things are providing multiple resources where you can actually do hands on stuff and learn. That's the only way. You have to do it in order to learn. And then, trust me, like learn the basics and start applying for jobs. You should be able to get it. Okay, that is what I'm doing actually. So, I'm uh, currently trying to, uh, you know, build some basic Docker images on my own. Mm -hmm. and like adding docker files and also trying to build my own cluster and yeah i mean i agree with your point that in i mean in application security yes you can escape somewhat if you are not a developer but in cloud you can't escape is what i believe mm -hmm. holds true yeah so yeah i mean uh, so just the way you say it's there is no shortcut right you have to do this keep no, learning exactly. and then apply. you should actually configure the stuff you should know how the different components in cloud works that's when actually you can secure it and that's when you will be able to break it. But yeah, anyways, happy yeah. to help you on this stuff. I can provide you more resources. Connect with me on LinkedIn and leave a message. Sure, sure. I'll connect with you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Guys, any other yeah. questions? Harsha, Nikhil, Gaurish. Yeah, uh, uh, one question. Th thanks a lot, Vas uh, Vasant. Uh, great session. I'll have to yeah. drop off. So thanks yeah, no a lot. Problem, I'll connect right. with you on LinkedIn. Thank or Thank you for uh, joining. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, uh, just one question about uh, runtime security falcon right this uh, uh, i think you mentioned alert alerting with uh, any other tools is integrated or you got to uh, 
uh, see, we need to know, right? It's uh, not everybody uses Slack or anything like that, right? No, right? absolutely. I was about to tell you on this thing because uh, I, I may not be able to cover everything in the demos in the few hours we have. You can integrate it with Slack. You can integrate it with email. You can you can integrate it with different uh, tickets. In fact, you can even integrate it with the Prometheus Grafana stack that we have seen. If you follow the documentation, okay. you should be able to integrate like this Falco uh, with the Prometheus. And then again, you can write alerts. You can use it with Jira, whatever you want. There are like n number of options. You don't need to limit yourself only to Slack. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I'm happy to assist you or help you on that one during a weekend or sometime because I'm actually yeah, really sure. tired. It's somewhere like close to 11 yeah. p.m. for me in Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I get it. Yeah. I, well, uh, it's wonderful, actually. I, see, I, I say I've been more into technology manage, uh, management and stuff. Doing uh, DevOps uh, engineers work with me, right? Uh, see, unless you are hands-on a little bit, right? You can't appreciate. I know some challenges I had faced, but uh, see, I, uh, with the pace, I was uh, not able to fully do it. And then I thought, okay, let me listen and uh, understand the things, and then follow up with uh, your material. So that I would definitely do. And then with any questions, it definitely be in touch. It's a good uh, uh, thing, right? Uh, basically, right? I, I will be in touch on a few things. Let's see, basically within companies, right? There is a team which does the Kubernetes setup and cluster and protection, security, blah, blah. Actual DevOps, we don't do all these security related mechanisms, but we only, uh, the uh, things what we do is more on a deployment perspective, right? Yeah, see, exactly. as, because what I see the gap is, right? Unless you know this, right? You can't. They, are they kind of doing the right things? We don't know, right? Exactly. And this is like a major gap in not just your organization, in like uh, most of the organizations. Yeah. Uh, and this is like a gap between like the security professionals and DevOps. DevOps doesn't know what uh, security is, and security people doesn't know how the DevOps works. This is like a huge gap. And this is where people need to work on actually bridging the gap between the DevOps and the security team. They need to collaborate and work together. But what you said is a very valid point, especially in the organizations like of your size or any bigger organizations, it's very challenging. Yeah, see, because they all work in silos, they, even though they call us collaboration. Oh, no, absolutely. I can totally understand because I work with a startup. I closely sit next to the DevOps guys. If they are not aware, I can write my DevOps scripts myself. I can do yeah. I, I have knowledge of DevOps and Kubernetes. But when I talk to my other friends who actually work in bigger organizations, banks and all, yeah, yeah. Like I can totally understand yeah. related to whatever you're saying. See, I want to see basically right, the things what you have given. I want to see if I can break something and then show to them, prove to them, right? These are things you our cluster is broken, right? Uh, do we? How do you go about it? So that's how the conversation is. You challenge somebody on something, and then that would probably trigger to make sure uh, the right things are in place. Right? I'm just this is one thought process to attack. And, uh, and one thing, probably in your organization, you may not come across everything that we have seen today. But security is all about. Uh, there is one thing: if out of hundred bugs. If you patch 99 out of 100, they don't say like you are 100% uh, secured, like 99% secured. You're still 100% vulnerable because the attacker needs one bloody loophole to get into your infrastructure. So out of all the scenarios that we have seen, I'm pretty sure your organization will miss at least one or the two things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I need to check what is what. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a good uh, session, actually. It'll be a good beginning to see the other side, basically, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, this yeah, is great session. I, I am really spellbounded with the session uh, and the knowledge uh, which you have shared from 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 scratch. You explained it from scratch to people who no doesn't know about the Kubernetes. I would love to congratulate you on that. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Arsha. And yeah, and thanks for your effort. I know I uh, people in the Melbourne. Yeah, I work for a Australian client. It's already eleven, and you dedicated. <laughs> Really, thanks. Hats off to you as well. And I would like to, <laughs> yeah. And uh, like, uh, I, I was not able to follow, I mean, not follow in the sense like I was not able to parallelly do it, but I will uh, be doing it uh, uh, today, night, or maybe tomorrow. And definitely, yeah, there will, when we have hands on, there are questions also. So maybe you I'll like, reach, out uh, to you. reach out to me on LinkedIn anytime. I'm always LinkedIn. available. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Great session, Vasan. I, I love that uh, you um, 
you covered a lot of things and that was like in such, such, a, uh, such a short span that was amazing good job like amazing job <laughs> yeah, thanks for it rick like i said i need to cut down most of the content to uh, set everything in the 4 hours usually the workshop will go up to like 7 or 8 hours but i'm glad i finished it up in 4 hours on friday evening yeah. <laughs> it was good i mean like people can uh, go uh, go home and like fo- follow this up but uh, all the things you uh, went through right that was great i mean good job and also the cluster setup which i have given it is like one of the state of the art yeah. uh, setup which you can utilize you have like two act, two clusters actually running all the kubernetes running only with just docker containers it's it's actually a very good setup with the jenkins running inside yeah. it like pushing the docker images to your uh, internal repositories it's it's very complicated setup yeah a lot of effort you put into this uh, whole setup <laughs> to make it very simple and straightforward of. for anyone yeah, yeah. absolutely agree, agree. Yeah. but i'm glad if you could write a small uh, feedback or anything on linkedin that will be great that will really yeah, help yeah definitely yeah. do that definitely. i would love to talk to you about uh, falco because that's one of my uh, interest areas and i work on that so sure. like we'll, we'll catch up on that sure for sure on linkedin yeah yeah thanks for awesome. thanks for the awesome session i would just want to ask for where i can get the access of recording uh nivedita i have actually recorded the session i'll be sharing it with the presenters or else you can directly email me and i will i uh, share it with you directly i will ping my email here in the zoom chat yeah so that's my email you can reach out to me here or just leave a message on linkedin i'll share it with you i'm not sure how huge how big it is for absolutely four and a half hours but i'll still try to share it Thank you thank you so much. Okay, thank Thanks you. Thanks Vedanta. Any other questions guys? Otherwise we can wrap up. Yeah. Cool. Then thank you so much guys. Thank you so much for joining. Enjoy rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Talk to you thank all you soon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks Vishnu.